forgot. All right. Well, it started, Brian. We'll just uh. Oh, that's all good. Oh, okay, that's fine. Now it's good. Go ahead. Just tell me when you're ready, Brian. All right, I'm ready. All right, three. We'll start at when it says five. All right. A little Germex because it's 2020. <laughs> COVID season. COVID season, motherfuckers. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. We really appreciate all support. Just want to give a quick shout out before we jump into tonight's film review. Just want to shout out our social medias and our website, don'tgooutthere.com is our website. You can find all of our episodes, interviews, celebrity shout outs in our store and our blog. And you can find all of our social medias there. Uh, we got the big three, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Don't go out there. Just search that and you'll find us. And tonight we have a special guest joining us for this film review. Uh, all four of us are Florida State football fans. That's how we started this uh, this horror podcast. And we've got a a former Florida State football player, Mr. Freddie Stevenson. Uh, Freddie, you want to introduce yourself to the listeners? That's national champion, Freddie Stevenson. Yeah, I played at Florida <laughs> State from 2013 to 2016. Had an opportunity to win the national championship during that time in the few ACC championships. And now I'm just doing my thing, man, trying to make an impact in this world and talking about horror movies, man. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, we always like to ask all of our guests, uh, what kind of got you into horror movies? Do you remember your first one you ever watched or anything like that? My first horror movie I watched. Um... Or maybe what's your favorite? What got me into horror movies was just the, when we were little kids, they would try to tell us little stories, the kind of, you know, watching all the kids, the little badass kids, trying to keep us from messing junk up, just make up little crazy stories. I'm like, yo, this is scaring them, but I, I like this. Like, y'all got to keep going. <laughs> and, but I don't know. Halloween was one of the movies that stuck with me, of course, Friday the 13th. But I always I always like Michael Myers for some reason. There you go, buddy. Oh, yeah. Me and you got into a little Twitter debate, fun debate. Nothing wrong with that. That's how, that's how this show started, honestly. Me and Mike uh, constantly arguing about that. Uh, <laughs> so go ahead, Freddie. Uh, you know, you asked Brian, I believe, to join us for a Michael Myers film review. Uh, why'd you pick Halloween H two O? Any particular reason? Fond of it? Um, it's just to be honest, it's the one I just remember off the top of my head. The other ones I'd have had to go back and watch just to know what went on. That one I can remember pretty much everything. And shoot, I just like how Mike came back in this one. Twenty years, man. He still had something on his chest about Lori. He had to come back to kill Lori after twenty years, man. Like that's the bit. See, I like that. Someone on this show doesn't like that dedication. <laughs> all right guys let's go ahead and jump into our general overview i'll go first uh this is going to be an episode sort of like freddie versus jason to uh, to brian i'm going to vent a little bit about michael myers in this movie and uh just the portrayal of michael myers uh i'm not the fa biggest fan of the portrayal but i do like this movie we uh, did a live show last night uh, we went live for the first time. That was really fun. I ranked this movie, I believe, 12th out of all 31 in the three big big three franchises. So I definitely don't dislike or hate this movie, but I do have frustrations with it. Uh, Mike Settle, the super Michael Myers super stand. You want to go next, brother? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's do that. Um, okay, I have a weird relationship w with this movie. Uh, sometimes I love it, and sometimes I get nitpicky about it, kind of like you are, Nico. Um, there's some good here. Obviously, I like the Laurie Strode, Michael Myers plot line. That doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I know the setting bothers people a lot, that it's not in the Midwest, that it's in California. It doesn't really, really bother me, except for a couple times where they they shoot stuff in the daylight that I think would have just been better at night. But that's about the only time. Uh, it doesn't bother me that they cut out parts four through six either. I like that about this movie because it just it's a little bit cleaner. Uh, we don't have the Cult of Thorn mess. So I like it. Uh, obviously I don't like all the masks. There's four different fucking Michael Myers masks in this movie. That's a bad thing. But I, I like the portrayal of Myers here, but I can understand, I think I understand where you're going to go with that, Nico. Uh, I think Jamie Lee Curtis is great here as Laurie Strode. She, to me, this is a glimpse into kind of what we get in 2018, but I almost like this one a little bit more because she's a little bit more human, not as much, uh, Sarah Connor. 
Uh, she, I wish they would have explored the alcoholism part a little more, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Some other good positives, and then I'm going to move on. Hello, Cool J. I fucking love you in this movie, man. <laughs> Me, too. Me too. And and by the way, Buster Rhymes should have taken notes. This is how you fucking act in a Halloween movie, Buster Rhymes. Hello, Cool J with his voluptuous, round, melon breast. <laughs> My man, LL Cool the hypocrisy. J. hypocrisy. <laughs> that is not hypocrisy. LL Cool J is a million miles better than Buster Rhymes ever was. Trick or treat. A, rom- a romantic, come a romantic not author, come on, okay. Better than Kung fucking Fu, dude. Come on, man. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway. Uh, I look forward to breaking it down. The only uh, one more bad thing I'll say about this movie is this movie has a lot of lame kills. I know that I'm not the only co-host that thinks that. Uh, but I love the meta. It has a very Scream influence, and I love the meta. And I have a nitpick about it later, but for the most part, again, I love meta horror, so I'm all in. Uh, a lot of fun. I think I had it 10th. Uh, but this most recent rewatch kind of moved it down for me a little bit. I think I would have had it a little bit higher. <laughs> Had we not done a rewatch here recently. So I'm looking forward to talking about it. Dustin, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and go next. Uh, this movie, the thing about this movie is it's the shortest in the Halloween franchise. And I like to say I'm glad. <laughs> you know, I don't hate this movie, but it's certainly not my favorite. I, I ranked it, Nico, you brought up last night. I, I ranked it 20th out of uh, all 31 of the Halloween Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street uh, franchise that I had one, two, three, four, four Halloween films behind it. So it's not like, uh, you know, it's in the top seven, I guess, but I just, they could have done so much better. They, they had so much more potential because they go back to the original storyline, which I love three through six never happened. Thank God. <laughs> you know, hey, uh, I like part four. You shut your mouth. I, li- I like part four too. I do. I do too. But if you're gonna go back, you know, that's fair. I, I, I like the direction. Let's just let's pretend they didn't happen because that's the bread and butter. That's the money storyline. So let's just continue off of part two, 1981's part two. Um, the cast is good. You've got Joseph Gordon-Levitt, love. You got Adam Arkin, who I'm a big fan of. I think I called him Alan Arkin last night. That's his father, who I'm also a fan uh, of. So that's but still, his dad, and he's good too. Good stuff. <laughs> Uh, Todd Smith, aka LL Cool J, good stuff. I'm not a big Josh Hartnett fan, but that's okay. Um, good cast. I just think that there's too there's too many too many cooks in the kitchen, maybe, uh, to where you can definitely see it. And then in the end, what you get is a kind of bland Halloween movie. They they could have done so much more, like you said, Mike. They could have explored the alcoholism storyline a little bit more. They could have the reveal of I'm actually Laurie Strode could have been bigger. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I feel like they just, they dropped the ball because they were, okay, well let's change this. Let's change this. And I know that they're, you know, the original script was uh, not anything. Which draft? I was going to say, which draft buddy? Right. And (laughs) so 11 drafts. At the end end of the day, I don't hate this movie. Um, I rewatched it again today and it was, it, it becomes more rewatchable every time I watch it. I don't know if that's just because I'm getting so familiar with it now that I'm like, okay, like I can tolerate it more, but they just, they left too many, they left too many, uh, too much meat on the bone from what they could have done, I guess. Yeah. Before you go, Brian, I agree with you, Dustin. I think there might've been too many cooks in the kitchen and one giant plot, or I won't say it's a plot hole, but one thing I really can't stand they made this movie super unbelievable how he gets from Illinois to California. Uh, yeah. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't think anybody can justify that, honestly. Well, uh, I mean, that's 2,000 miles, for God's sake, driving. Hey, how like, far is it from Crystal Lake to Manhattan on a boat? I don't know. I didn't, do, I didn't do the math. Oh, uh, but okay. go ahead. I'm just wondering. That's, did, that's, did Jason <laughs> have to drive? I, I believe Jason can swim. I'm pretty sure Jason can drive. Oh, that okay. Hey, you're reaching for your that, guy there. Movie, Fuck you. I'm, you're I'm, reaching for your be, guy. No, I wouldn't no, be surprised reaching. if he drove that boat in that movie. The script was so bad. I'm, yeah. I would not be surprised if he drove that. That is a Michael Jordan and Space Jam ass reach, bro. Don't even don't do that. <laughs> so Get he, out of here. Yeah. Jason had to stop at gas stations with his mask on and didn't raise any alarms. Oh no, I agree with that. That's oh. stupid. But let's not <laughs> but let's not defend Jason swimming to Manhattan either. Come on now. <laughs> he didn't swim. He was rode a, he rode a you know, God damn. What do you come here for this? Hey, you're right. He did ride a boat. That's what the movie should have been called. All right, Brian, go ahead. 
All right, look, it's no secret. I love this movie. Um, it holds a special place with me because my mom watched the original in 78 in the theaters. And she's not a horror fan, but she liked this movie, partic- or 78 Halloween in particular. And she was the in- one that introduced me to uh, to that movie. And uh, me and her got to go see this H2O in the theaters together 20 years later. And uh, was also the first Halloween film I ever saw in the theaters um, as I was just finally of age to go see one. Um I think I was a freshman in high school when this came out. But, uh, you know, at times, this has been my favorite in the franchise. Um, You know, it's currently my third favorite entry at the moment um, in the Halloween franchise. Uh, If you caught our 31, 31 last night, um, if not, it's being released on Halloween. And it's also going to be available on don'tgooutthere.com. Look, look, this movie to me is right in my wheelhouse. And uh, some may think of this as a negative, but I mean, I don't, obviously. But it's very 90s. Very Kevin Williamson, who I've proclaimed I'm a big fan of on the show many times. Um, you know, he helped write this, but obviously wasn't credited for it. <clears throat> In fact, Kevin Williamson brings me to this, and I want to say off the bat, because the three of you already have said that it, many people, he, he, you guys have said this exact thing, but many people say the same thing, like like 2018, a different timeline, and it's only a direct sequel to Halloween 2, and, you know, it kind of wipes out, you know, parts four through three through six or whatever even if you count three or whatever but uh this is why i think that this is correct and in my opinion and this is why i read it but i mean it's williamson who wrote the scene in this script and i want to read this in its entirety maybe in our fun fact section if we don't go too long but to summarize it you know jamie lloyd is referenced as having been murdered and uh laurie throws up and breaks down crying in the middle of class Uh, there's a whole scene now i get you say that you know things make scripts drafts all the time and uh, they get cut out, and you'd be right. But this, the thing with this that makes it canon for me is that it was filmed. Like, this wasn't just some idea that didn't make it past a certain point. Like, this scene was filmed and ended up being cut out of the final cut. But, you know, aspects, obviously, and we'll talk about it, still exist in the film. So this is, to me, no different than all the scenes like, for instance, Lou Temple's uh, scene in Halloween 7 that didn't, like, make the theatrical cut but very much part of the film to me because I only like the director's cut of that movie that was put out later. And uh, so that's why this is not its own line timeline to me and never has been, in my opinion, and is a sequel to one through six as it was all, always to me originally intended to be. Um, I'm also one of those cats who think of this movie like in a vacuum and the unofficial end to the original timeline. Um, although I am glad and I've moved it up in my rankings. I mean, Halloween 18 was, is, is my number two overall Halloween. So I, I enjoy, I'm enjoying the new timeline. It took me a little bit, but I'm back in, I, I'm into it now. And, uh, but that, that's how I feel about this movie in particular. All right, Freddie, you got any, uh, any more quick thoughts on the movie before we jump into the scene by scene, brother? Yeah, I got um, mixed feelings about it. Like I can watch it through and through and enjoy myself, but at the same time, I agree with some of what Mike was saying about the killings. Um, some yeah. of them they don't really they don't really make sense. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's not realistic at all. And then the one we'll talk about at the end, I just don't get that one. But and then the mask thing, man, we got they got my man Mike at some points in the movie. It's looking like a whole bunch of Netflix film, man. They they doing it wrong. But we'll we'll get into that. But I don't yeah. know, I got mixed feelings about it, but I always enjoy watching it. And Nick. Hey, Nico, I, I, yeah, I, I'm with you, Freddie. I enjoy this movie. I really do. But I got mixed feelings on it. It's right. they don't I don't feel like this franchise has never lived up to the greatness Michael should have been, but go ahead, Mike. Yeah, actually I want to piggyback right off of that, Nico. But before we start the scene breakdown, I said it last night and I want to repeat it here in case someone didn't watch. If you get the Myers mask right, there's a lot that I can forgive in your movie if it's bad, if you get the mask right. Because we talk about some of these Jason movies where there may be some some ass stuff, but at least I know it's Jason. Like, that's the look. This is the mask. He's going around. The body count is high. It's a fun slasher movie. If you get the Myers mask wrong like it does a lot in this movie, it's, it, it's d- distracting in a way. Because I can't think about him being Michael Myers. I think about this mask being ass. And so it really does get in the way of what could be a much better movie now, is this movie great even with a good mask? No, but I think it could have been helped a lot with the right proper mask. This movie has four different masks, including mm-hmm. a CGI one, which I know we probably should have saved for fun facts, but no, it has a fucking CGI mask, and it pisses me off every time I see it. <laughs> the funny thing about one of the masks in this movie 
is I, I've texted to you guys in our group chat. One of the masks that they use looks like a Roger Bart mask. And if you don't know who Roger Bart is, if you've ever seen Harold and Kumar escape from Guantanamo Bay, he's Beecher, the guy that's yeah. like trying to talk sense. Uh, that the mask looks like it was molded <laughs> from his face. But anyway. Oh man. Hey, the mask they should have stuck with the entire time was from the curse of Michael Myers. It would have been a, trem- yeah. a tremendous upgrade from what they ended up going with. Oh yeah. Uh, y'all ready to jump into scene by scene? Let's do it. All right. We get a, the film starts off with a Mr. Sandman intro. It's October 29th, 1998. Nurse Marion notices her outside light is smashed when she gets home and walks inside, but then goes next door to get some neighbor kids, Jimmy and Tony, to check it out. They call the cops, and then Jimmy decides to check it out himself before the cops show up. He walks in trash talking and hockey stick swinging. He walks in Marion's office and has been has been wrecked. He goes into the kitchen and steals some beers, but gets jump scared by a closing door and swings the sticks on all the pots and pans. He walks out. He walks out and says, "Coast is clear," but the house has been wrecked. Marion's power is out. She gets a flashlight and notices her file on Lori Strode is empty. She walks down the hall and Michael's at the end of the hallway, unseen. I do like that part. The door flies open and she runs next door. She finds a dead Jimmy in the chair, ice skate to the face. Then she opens the door and a dead Tony falls on her. Michael enters the house. The cops show up finally, but it's to her house next door. She attacks Michael with a fire poker, then breaks the window, but Michael cuts her throat as she calls for help. Michael drives off into the distance. Cops investigate the home. Marion was Loomis' nurse until he passed away. The cop jokes about it being Myers. They say she was obsessed with Michael. He's gonna, he said, the cop says he's gonna call Haddonfield. <clears throat> Excuse me. Opening credits roll with a Myers score. Tom Kane, as Loomis voiceover, narrates on Myers. We're in the halls of the boarding school now and in a classroom. It strikes midnight and flashbacks to Lori in the closet, then a knife in her son's picture. Lori screams, waking up. It was a nightmare. John, her son, wakes her up checking on her and gets her her meds. Summer Glen, California, October 31st. Breakfast time, and John and Lori argue over him going on a class trip to Yosemite. She won't let him go, and and he's pissed off. She's still scarred from her trauma 20 years ago. John is going to class now with Charlie and Sarah. Lori looks out the window, and you see like a reflection of Michael Myers beside her in the window. Molly joins the three in the courtyard. All, All four of them can't go to Yosemite. And Charlie says that they can all have a big orgy. All right, that's the first two scenes I got. Brian, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure, man. Um, so there's so many damn references in this movie and Easter eggs to this franchise and other movies. It's crazy. Hopefully we get all of them. But you know, right off the bat, Mr. Sandman, I know that's a, a Halloween trope and me and Nico were talking about that just earlier. But I saw Back to the Future first before this movie. So sorry. Every time I hear that song. Back to the Future is what I think about every single time, but but I I do love it here and every other time it's in the Halloween movies, um, and I remember always thinking of uh, Jamie Lee Curtis like Jennifer Aniston for instance with Leprechaun where she you know she got her start in some low budget horror movie but moved on to be a huge actress and I never believed that she would ever come back to the franchise growing up watching it, um, you know she said she did it as a love letter to the fans and to thank the franchise for getting her where where she where she was or or at that point. And, uh, you know, I think she gives a great performance as, as in this movie, and we'll get to it later, but I think that this is her best rendition of Laurie Strode. Um, also, right off the bat, I love the atmosphere here. Um, it feels like Halloween. <clears throat> I do understand that we all wish, like my, Mike talked about, that this was Haddonfield, but, I mean, after everything, I, I can understand that Marion Chambers, who, by the way, is played once again by Nancy Stevens, reprising her role, her role from uh, 1 and 2, um, she, you know, I, I, we understand why, why she moved away from Haddonfield. Um, you know, she'll also be back for Halloween kills, by the way. She, she looks, I, I think she looks great in a role here. Um, I love her. I love how, you know, she doesn't do the horror movie trope, uh, in the scene too, and immediately leaves the premises and doesn't go explore. Um, I got a little Easter egg here with, uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt wearing that, uh, hockey mask. Um, that's a little Easter egg because Steve Miner directed this and Friday the 13th part two and three. Um, and had a special relationship with Jamie Lee Curtis, which is why, um, you know, she, he got that directing job here, but Hey, don't they kind of do the same thing with Myers ransacking an office, uh, to find out about Jamie in part four. Um, it's been a while since I've seen that movie, but it seems like I vaguely remember that they do this almost same exact thing in that movie. It's um, pretty or, similar, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty similar. Um, 
And, you know, Mike talked about mass earlier. You know, I think it's, I agree with him. It's pretty universally agreed upon that the part six mask is one of the good ones in the franchise. And, and, and that's the mask that they used for this opening shot right here. So I don't know why the hell they didn't just stick with that one. I'll never know. But apparently, like you said, it's a mixture of a cod and producer tampering and some of it being minor. It was a huge point of contention, apparently. And, and the product we got simply stinks. Um, Mike's completely right. It's the number one thing I hate about this movie. It's distractingly bad in some places, which we'll get to, I'm sure. But but here in this scene, I think it's fucking great. Um, I also say I also say that I hate Michael Myers fucking driving. I always have. It's weird, but I mean it's it's canon all the way back to the first one. So you know the the dude drives <laughs> drives around town. It is what it is. But uh. I love the credits with Loomis voice playing over, or Loomis's voice play over, which, I mean, I know it's not Donald Pleasant, so you pass at this point, but they got uh, Tom Kane as a voice actor to mimic his voice, and it's not perfect. It's no Mike Settle impression, <clears throat> but I think it's I think it's pretty damn good. Um, I'd also like to point out the shot of Jamie Lloyd's scissors in that montage uh, from the end of Halloween 4, which further remnants of what Kevin Williams had added to the script. Um you know, I love that nightmare scene as well. It was a good introduction to Lori again after all these years. Um, I also I honestly remember getting some applause in the theater uh, when that when she came on the screen for the first time. Um, and I also love how it kind of sets up her uh, relationship with her son. I loved I'm the opposite of Dustin in that. I love Josh Hartnett and just about whatever he's been in. And I really think that Williamson wrote like a good group of dialogue for the teenagers. Um uh, Jamie Lee Curtis originally wanted Lori's life to be kind of in shambles at the start of this film. But uh, Williamson convinced her that Laurie should have more to lose, which I agree with, honestly. Um, they did a good job with it in 18, but I, I've gone into what I would have changed in 18. And some of that includes that whole drunk dinner scene where they're trying to convey her life is in shambles, basically. And uh, lastly, you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's escape to the face. You know, I definitely agree that the kills aren't great. Um, but like I said before, I, I think that this is a product of its time. The kills, I, I don't think, start becoming like mainstream really until like Saw up the game and a few years later. And uh, I think the MPAA on some of that shit go because, I mean, if you remember in our Scream 2 review, they had to cut like half the kills in that movie to scale them back because of the MPAA. Um, but, you know, regardless, everybody's completely, definitely right. Uh, if you think that they're lacking because, you know, most of them are off screen completely. So it's not even a lack of creativity. It's just that they were like, man, we're not even going to show it. So that's all I have there. Yeah, so I agree with a lot of what you said, Brian. Um, but just to start out, I love the use of Mr. Sandman. And I texted Dustin this. Obviously, I was rewatching. I said, I really wish more horror movies would use Mr. Sandman because it's a creepy ass song when used properly. And I think it works here. I think it works in Halloween. And it is a trope, but I do think it works uh, as a horror movie song. So I think that's kind of fun. I like this opening scene a ton. There's a small part of me that wonders. It almost feels like it's from a different movie. Like if you took this opening scene and slapped it with more scenes in the same setting in a different Halloween movie, I feel like that would be a fun sequel to explore. Uh, Michael's back, but he's one town over. He, you know, he got the nurse. You know, he's getting everybody from that first movie. And I, I don't know. I like it a lot. It's um, I've always thought they should move, you know, Myers to the surrounding towns. That would be kind of a fun sequel just to get him out of Haddonfield. We've talked about it. I like the Laurie Strode story, but I know I, sometimes I feel like Nico where you could venture off of that if you really wanted to. And I think like this opening scene kind of reflects that that would be a lot of fun. I think it would be really cool. Um, the Justin Gordon Levitt with the Jason mask is awesome to me. That's meta as hell. And I know why, you know, like Brian said, Steve Miner is the director, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, his character sucks, though. What a little asshole. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. He goes in Marion's house and fucks everything up and steals her beer. And, man, come on, dude. Have a little cooth about yourself. Takes one, huh? takes one bite of a cookie and puts I it know, back. Dude, what a that dick. was the big – dude, I said that. I said, oh, you're going to fucking have one bite? Eat the whole cookie, man. Uh, yeah, so uh, – you know, when you're first watching this movie and you don't – before you get the reveal that uh, Loomis had been living with Marion, you're kind of wondering why the fuck does she have a framed picture of Loomis and a whole file in, in, on Lori Strode in her house. Like, before that reveal happens, you don't know that. So you're kind of questioning, like, why the fuck does Marion Chambers have a Lori Strode file in her house? But that's answered kind of anyway. Um, I love – the the back and forth between Marion Chambers and Michael Myers. I like that a little bit. She fights for her life. I think that's a really good 
really good Halloween stuff there. Uh, obviously, Michael wins. But I like the opening credits a lot. Again, it's not a perfect Loomis, but it's good enough. It, it makes it feel very Halloween, very I'm not even going to try to do Loomis tonight because I don't have it. I got to be in the mood to do it. But uh, I, too, hate Michael Myers driving. However, like Brian mentioned, he's been driving since the first movie. And I didn't like it in that movie. It's my one nitpick in that movie. And so it's still a nitpick. But again, it is canon, like you said. So I'm willing to kind of move on from it. Uh, I don't love it, especially because he takes a fucking road trip in this movie, which is ridiculous. Uh, unless he's got a damn, you know... <laughs> smart car that he has to plug in on the side of the road, then I don't know how the fuck he made it that far, but it is a nitpick. I, I understand. I understand people's problems with it. Um, I, I, so we meet Laurie Strode, which by the way, uh, and Jamie Lee, you call me sometime in this movie, sweet baby Ray's, uh, whew, anyway, but I like the nightmare scene. I think it's a great way. And like me and Dustin kind of hit on earlier, that is unexplored too much in this movie. the, the trauma, the PTSD from the events in 78, they don't go heavy enough with it to me. I know this wasn't what this sequel was for, but man, there's some good unexplored stuff there that I felt like they did a better job in 2018 of kind of showing how that affects her, even though 40 years after the fact. But uh, I still really like this version of Lori Strode. I think it's well acted by Jamie Lee Curtis. I like the mom-son dynamic with her and Josh Hartnett. I, I, I think it works. I like their back and forth for the most part, and I agree. I think Kevin Williamson did a good job writing the teens dialogue, which most of these Howie movies have shitty teens inside characters. This one gets it right. I feel like these are natural friends. I like the dialogue between the two because I'm going to tell you right now, 17-year-old me would have definitely picked hanging out with my friends in an empty school than going to Yosemite National Park. I can tell you that much right now. Beer, boobs, whatever, man. It's all good over here. I don't got to see no national. Now I'd go to Yosemite. But then, eh, I'm doing the same thing those guys are doing, man. So I like the teen characters. It doesn't feel forced. And, uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much all I have on those scenes. I, I think it's a good set of scenes that I think the movie kind of – I'm not going to say it gets completely worse after this, but this is – right after this is kind of where the problems start because we get to the rest stop, and I'll save it. But there, there are some problems after this. Oh, yeah. Hey, Freddie, you can go ahead and go next, brother. Hey, you're muted. <laughs> I do the same stuff. It's all good. Uh, but yeah, the Mr. Sam, man, I, I love that to start the movie. I agree with you guys. Just the vibes it brought into the movie, man. It kind of got me eager for what was what lied ahead. And um, yeah, the Loomis. What's Halloween without Loomis in it, man? You you gotta have you gotta have Loomis in it. I definitely love that touch. It wasn't perfect, but I think it provided a great touch to the movie. And I'm I'm gonna go a little off off topic a little here with Joseph Gordon Levitt with when he went into the house, I might have been that guy at that point. I was like, man, I gotta see his ass get killed. Like he he has to get killed. He's an asshole in this movie. I love him <laughs> in other movies, but he I hope he gets his ass killed and I got my wish later on in the movie. But um yeah um that part and then marrying just that dialogue with I didn't know that she was living with Loomis. So that dialogue there, I just found that out. Now, I didn't pay that pay that much attention to it, but y'all just t taught me something new just now. But um, that dialogue there, and then I definitely believe with some things that they left untouched. Like, I I thought they should have dug a little deeper, like you said, until 1970, before he had that interaction with Michael. I thought they should have dug deeper into that, even though... It's a different script for this movie. I thought they should have dug deeper in that. They would have made the movie a lot more intense. Would have made the movie more of a thriller, I believe. Um, but it, it still was good. To, when she woke up from the dream, I was like, all right, okay. And then she looked up at the thing. She noticed it was her son's 17th birthday. I was like, all right. So <laughs> now we're getting into something. Okay, so she... um. Her interaction with Mike was 17 when he was 17, when she was 17. So I was like, all right, okay. Now they're trying to do a little rewind of everything, and she's trying to let her son know, okay, it's Halloween. And Mike, Mike, he never he never lets me chill, he never chills on me. So you gotta know what's up. And Josh is like, man, I'm not paying attention that I'm going out, I'm finna have fun with my friends, we finna get drunk, we finna party. It's like, yo, you don't, oh you, don't you, you don't understand what's going on, man. Like He's not going to chill. I, I hate Mike driving. Like it's, 
I don't know. It's like a comedy every time I see him in the closet, man. How does this man even know how to drive? Like I, he was I, doing very well last night. Oh, sorry. Every time, <laughs> every time I see him walking and stuff, and then he hops in the car, it's like, man, come on now. That's like me freestyling when I was legit trying to get something from the candy store or something, and my parents called me driving a damn car. Like, how the, how the hell did Mike figure out how to drive? But I mean, it's a lot of stuff that's untouched in this movie. The the beginning of the movie kind of got me excited for what lies ahead, but. We'll get into the next scenes in a little bit. Hey, Dustin. Yeah. Before you go, does anyone else think that Marion Chambers had her throat slit because she smoked cigarettes? That had to be like, I don't know. I think that was a touch on the nose, man. I think so. I've always thought that every time I see it. Because throat, throat cancer. Uh, no, okay. I still think that's a thing. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. This movie is meta as fuck, so, you know. That's fair. But, I mean, it's yeah, open for interpretation. Yeah. Uh, like it's I said earlier, I love, movie, so. I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I, uh, I wish that he was in this movie more. I understand why he's not, though, in the way that he was in and out and still made a huge impression on uh, on me for his portrayal in this film. Like I, I thought it was well done. It's about as good as you can ask someone to be in a movie for 10 minutes for. Um, I think that, yeah, he was an asshole, but like... Come on, we we were probably that teenage kid, right? Like that smart Facts. smart mouth kid, Facts. and uh, your your neighbor asks you, "Hey, can you check out my house? I think someone broke in? You're just gonna go in, knock some shit over, and no, everything looks good." Um, I don't think I, I love Nancy Stevens being brought back. Um, and you know that that was a nice touch, to nice nice callback to the original continuity. It was odd placement in that kitchen for that uh, fold out ironing board. I remember, like, when that ironing board falls and it scares the shit out of him, I'm like, who the hell just has an ironing board in the middle? Because it's not like it's over in the corner of the kitchen or anything. It's in the middle of the damn kitchen. Um, all the doors that keep opening and closing themselves in this movie, because this is not the only time it happens, I think that that's lazy and kind of hokey. I don't, I didn't really like that. Um, the She didn't give the cops enough time. I'm sorry, but if you're a single white woman who's however old she was at this time 40 plus years old living alone and your house has been broken into you're going to trust a kid to say okay the coast is clear and you're just going to go back in automatically without waiting they said 15 minutes for the cops and she's like well fuck that i'm going in um yeah. so i think that was stupid the skate to the face was awesome but <laughs> i did like that kill i wish it would have been on screen but then but so so we could see that but at the same time i kind of like the surprise the the reveal of how it was done that's one of those ways like i've said uh, a couple weeks ago how if an off-screen kill is done right i think it's okay because if we see him stab the skate in the face it's not going to be as shocking we're not going to you know the, the reveal wouldn't have been as good now and talking about off-screen kills that i hate I hate the fact that she just opens the door and there's a dead body standing up so and then stupid. it falls over. I think so that was lazy. Um, <sighs> oh, another thing that this is a nitpick that I have with movies in general, not just this movie, but cops don't just roll up on non-emergent situations with their sirens on. Like they told them on the phone, everything's good, but her house has been broken into and they just come in with their sirens on full blast. No, that's that's not how the cops really operate, but that's okay. Um, and these cops were worse than Dewey. We can agree, right? These Those cops were worse than Deputy Dewey. Uh, most horror movie cops are terrible, including Dewey, so yes. <laughs> and well, definitely Haddonfield cops are definitely. Yeah, I, but, so. I mean, I know this isn't Haddonfield, but it's close enough. But it's like, you know, the, the house is broken into, and then they immediately see, oh, shit, this house has been broken into also. They don't happen to know a car creeping out of that driveway with its lights off. Get out of here. The whole movie could have been saved right there or stopped right there. Um, the title card was a nice montage, a, a nice little trip through the films. I, I really liked that. It was a nice touch. And Loomis' speech, obviously, what, what you guys said, uh, you know, they wanted to use the original Donald Pleasant's audio. They just couldn't clean it up, which they did it as good as they could because – Tim Kane did a good job, but then also adding the little effect where his voice was, you know, the little trailing effect filter yeah. that they put on his voice helped mask it even more. So I thought that was really, really well done. Uh, the last thing I have, man, John, what a dick. You talk about an absolute asshole to his mom. And I'm not just saying this because I don't really care for Josh Hartnett. But when she was like, 
your father was a, a methadone yeah. addicted junkie, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, wow, who could attract that? And yeah, she's like, ouch. Yeah. Yeah, and then yikes. he follows it up by saying, and to think he left you. Woo. I don't know if I tell my mom might have caught me with a two piece of the ribs if I say some slick shit like that. But <laughs> what a dick. Uh, but that's all I got on the first opening scenes. I, there's potential there, but yeah, like you know, why did why does he why did she have a, a file on Lori Strode? Why did he just take the shit out of the file instead of just taking the folder too? Your paper is going to get everywhere, Michael. That's poor organization skills. Uh, and then we still don't really under uh, didn't really explain at this point what was in that file. Like, did the file even say that she was in California now? Why would that file say she's in California now? But anyway, I, I thought that, you know, if she's in hiding or witness protection type situation, you might be a little bit more protective with her current location for this exact reason. But whatever. That's fine. We had to get from point A to point B. And it was it was an OK set of scenes. And Mike, before we get out of here, at some point, I want you to think about it between now and the end of this episode. You've got to do a Donald Pleasance quote that has something to do with ironing now, because now it's all I can think about is him and Nurse Marion Chambers in there ironing the fucking kitchen. Could you so, uh, <laughs> I don't know. The condition we saw Loomis in Halloween 6 in, and that's the same. If we're going off your timeline, he wasn't ironing nothing. That man was just sitting there chilling, collecting dust. Iron my polos. But before we go to the next two scenes, I do want to say that I re- I honestly really do like the opening scene. Yeah. Up until uh, you know the opening, the title card and the opening credits. I think that opening scene is really good. Mm-hmm. You get you know the Mister Sandman. I love that. The uh, the you can feel the the fall, the Halloween atmosphere too. I think with the uh, yeah. you know the kids outside playing, the leaves rustling. Uh, I really like the opening scene. Honestly, I um, I don't, I'm I'm with Dustin. Though. I don't like the kill where the guy's just standing there and he falls in. I hate that part, but uh, I really like the opening scene. All right, the next two scenes. A woman pulls over with her daughter at a rest area, and we see the cars Meyer stole parked there. They go into the men's room to use the bathroom. They each get into a stall, and the door slams That they, because she propped the door open for, the, for some sunlight to get in. She sets her purse down, and someone snatches the purse. She looks, she looks through the crack in the door, and she sees it's Myers. He walks out, and then we hear the little girl scream, but she's just got spiders in her hair, and Michael drives away in her car. Lori tells the students the rules of the trip. I wrote, Charlie is still big horny. We'll stop Lori and have work talk. Norma, the secu- the secretary, chats with Lori now, too, about, you know, plumbing issues at the school. We'll drop some smooches on Lori. I, and by the way, her name is Carrie Tate in this movie a lot, but I wrote, her name's Lori. I'm not it's going back and forth. Between, I'm not going back and forth with that. We'll drop some smooches on Lori as they close the door and confirm lunch plans. We meet Ronnie, the guard, and he's on the phone with his wife, and he's an aspiring romance author. Wife ain't, his wife ain't feeling it. John and Charlie ask to leave campus to get a gift for Molly. John persuades him to let him out. Lori goes into town for her lunch date. She gets jump-scared by kids trick-or-treating at one in the afternoon and sees Michael in the window, and she turns around and Will's there. They sit down to eat, and she talks about John. She tells, she tells uh, her boyfriend, she tells him she's tried everything to get over it. She orders another glass of wine before she going back to work. Charlie sneaks out of the store with a bottle, and he and John walk down the street, and Lori catches them. What the fuck do you think you're doing of all the days to pull this shit, she yells. John says he's not responsible for her, and Michael Myers is dead, and it's time to move on. It's been 20 years, and what's he waiting on? More Mr. Sandman as they drive off, and we see the stolen car watching them. Ronnie lets them back in the gate, and the Myers car pulls up behind them and stares, then drives off. Ronnie opens the gate, and then Lori scolds him for letting John and Charlie out. And then Ronnie, you know, in a meta moment, he calls her psycho. All right, Brian, that's the next two scenes I got. Hey, I just wanted to say, like, you, Nico, you talking about how you didn't like the scene where Marion, like, finds JGL and then turns around and, like, his body, like, falls through the door. And I, I'm not saying this just because you said this at all, but it reminded me that while I was watching this movie, I thought – God, that seems just like a Friday the 13th movie, like, like exact. Th- and then I thought, well, maybe it's because it's the director of Friday the 13th, two and three. Like, it just seems like it would be the exact sequence in one of those old, you know, uh, early 80s Friday the 13th movies. Anyway, I, I, that's that's what it reminded me of. So you just said that it reminded me. Well, that's how in part three, Chris finds uh, Shelly with his throat cut in the little closet or whatever mm-hmm. he's fake. You know, I mean, it, yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. But the difference to me is that. Part three, Friday the 13th, was 
mid eighties or whatever, and this is nineteen ninety eight. Like we're still doing this shit. Like, a yeah. lot of things used to be more hokey back in the eighties than they are now. That's true. That's true. So that's um, my beef with it. Speaking of hokey, the uh, the mask that's used in this the, for the majority of this film and these scenes here isn't really that bad. Um, the problem I have with this mask, uh, which is one of the four, like Mike said, um, is how you can see his damn eyes. It's very distracting. Like, I don't want to see his eyes, which, you know, I know that's the least of the problems with the rest of the masks used in this movie. But that was my problem with this particular mask. And I just want to say to me, Charlie is miscast. Like, I appreciate Adam Hamburg's acting ability. I can't do it. And, you know, and he was originally cast for something else we'll get into. But if they're going to have him dating Sarah, Jody uh, Lynn O'Keefe's character, they needed a different actor because he doesn't fit there at all. It's not believable to me at all that she is dating this dude. There's no way he's pulling that. And uh, the bathroom scene, look, I think it has a lot of really good tension here. But, you know, some shit I don't understand why the mom was, I mean, like, she just sat down in the stall next to her daughter. Like, she wasn't, like, pull her pants down or anything. It was just like she was just sitting down resting. You know, and I'm sorry, like, I'm sorry. Okay, the child actor there, she's not very good at all. Sorry, Emily Thompson. I, you know, I, I'm I'm sure you're a much better actor than me. Or hell, maybe not, because she hasn't done anything since two episodes of the TV show Charmed, and that's literally it. So I don't know. I don't. That was I'm an asshole. That was mean, right? My bad. Um, and, and unless you live under a rock, you're aware that Janet Lee is Jamie Lee Curtis's mom, and uh, she was in Psycho, and that she's playing the secretary here. Um, a little tidbit. PJ Souls was approached for it, but uh, couldn't decide if she wanted to do it or not, and they went with Janet Lee while they were, you know, while she was deciding. But oh, I think oh, that's PJ Souls. Well, I th- I think that's a good choice because I don't I don't like people playing other characters in universe anyway. I know PJ Souls looks nothing like she did in 1978, but it just would stand out to me too much. Um, you know, I, I agree with Mike. I have a little tidbit of how much I love LL Cool J. Um, you know, in anything he's honestly been in, I like him a lot. Um, I love him in this scene where he started, where you did the round melon breasts. It cracked it cracked me up. And uh, lastly, I, I'm on I'm on board with Nico with this, especially in this movie. I do not like all the jump scares. I did not realize it until this rewatch how damn many there were in this movie, yeah. and that and that sort of thing doesn't really bother me usually. But god damn, there is like way too many in this movie. It's it was to the point where it was bothering me, and it usually doesn't. Yeah, so uh, so this rest stop scene has so, so, some good and bad to me. Uh, it does some some of the Myers suspense stuff really well, very classic Halloween stuff. But it also, I don't, again, this is a big no-no with the Michael driving. So the fact that he not only stops here, takes somebody else's car, like it's all, it, it, it's a little much. Uh, I have to suspend my disbelief a little too much, and I really shouldn't have to do that in a Halloween movie. Um, but uh, again, like you said, the acting is kind of bad. As far as bathroom scenes go, 2018 wins that going away when, when it comes to this, because again, in and every Halloween movie is a nod to the one before it. Uh, 2018 gets it right. Absolutely. Right. And this is just okay here. Um, so again, we get more interaction with, uh, with Lori and, and Josh Hartnett, I'm sorry. I'm drawing a bl- oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Okay, I just do that from time to time. John. But John, so you get more Lori and John, and I really do like their dynamic. But John's a little bit of an asshole here. But there's a part of me, seventeen-year-old me, that kind of understands that. Like, I mean, so so restrictive as a parent, you can't do anything. Uh, I don't know. Most of the time, you want to break those chains and. She doesn't let him. And so, I mean, again, I see both sides. That's that's why, again, they didn't explore the character of Laurie Strode enough. This is another uh, thing with that where I think you could have really dove into him and her kind of having a, a bit more of a struggle there. And I know there was an original script that really did that where where John, like, you know, mocked Laurie and wore the Myers costume and, like, the school dance or whatever. So there's a lot of alternate scripts out there that kind of have that Touched on a little more. I just felt like they kind of missed the boat here. Uh, I fucking love LL Cool J, though. I already hit on the round melon breast. I think he's great. Uh, I think he's great in everything he's in, to be quite honest. And, look, I hate to bring this back up, but if we're talking about rappers in the Halloween franchise, 
He's superior. That's all I'm going to say. Trick or treat, motherfucker. Uh, well, I don't why, don't have you, a... why don't you just tell him to call you sometime? God, dang. Maybe I will. <laughs> Maybe I he was, will. Yeah, he was talking about LL Cool J's round melon breasts that he liked the best. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey he could probably do the peck pop of love. I don't know. I don't know how LL Cool J gets down. Uh, but no, I, um, I don't have a ton on these scenes, and it's just because I don't think so much happens here. But like... <laughs> Uh, God, there's a lot of characters in this, so I didn't write everybody down, but my man is literally in this movie to be horny. Charlie, he's literally in this movie to be horny, which I can appreciate. It's like the Twitter timeline. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't, um, the whole scene with Mike driving and switching cars, like, I didn't like that, man. They, they got my man Mike, they took away from everything I loved about Mike when they did all of that, like, Mike is known for being savage, and they got this man, like, he just put deep thought into everything, thought of his next 10 steps. That's not Michael Myers. It shouldn't be Michael Myers. He, he doesn't do that. So I didn't really like how they played that one out. It, You're right. You're it, was, right. It, was it was weird to me. I didn't really like that. Him driving, We it is what it is. We all hate that. But you guys said, and I'm kind of jumping, jumping forward, Charlie and the girl he got, there's no way. Oh, yeah. I thought that the whole movie, my man. Listen, no fucking way. Exactly. Exactly. No fucking way. It's a, it's a movie out on called Love Don't Cause a Thing where a guy paid the girl to um, date him and stuff. <laughs> that may have been what was going on with Charlie. There's no way in any... I don't... I'm, it, I'm thank not, you. I'm not thank buying you. that. She looked too good. Thank you. But, yeah, it, it was kind of all over the place. The, um, what's his name? John in this movie. I keep saying his real name, but... John, his relationship with his mom, you get it. Because, I, like you said, how we were in high school, you don't really want, like, we're all rebellious. So I understand I understand that situation. So John was kind of fighting. Like, she's trying to let him know what's going on, trying to keep him tight with her, but he's still fighting. He doesn't really know what's going on. But it, it is what it is. I just didn't like, the whole thing that bothered me about this scene, this stage of the movie, these scenes, was just the Michael Myers moving around from car to car. Like, I didn't, I wasn't really feeling that. Yeah, so first of all, what the hell kind of rest stop was that? I mean, Dude. there's one solitary building, and it's several yards off of the parking spots, and it's just a rickety asshole building. I've never seen a rest stop like that off of, off a of major highway. Whatever. Uh, and there's there's no lights that doesn't appear. Like, that's just a place you go for a good old-fashioned raping or murder. Like, it's just no good. No good can come from that place. Um, oh, and also... A, Who the a, hell? Hold on, hold on. A good old fashioned <laughs> raper murder. <laughs> good old fashioned. You ever seen Reno nine one one Miami? That's what she says. Trudy says good old, good old fashioned, fashioned raping. Um. So also, who the hell just puts their purse on the floor of a public restroom like that? Like right underneath the door. Like you already knew you were going in the men's room, and so you, but there's no one in there. But someone could come in, and you just set your purse at the edge of the of the stall there to where he can just walk by and swipe your purse, swipe your keys, whatever. Uh, uh, you know, and also they didn't really do a good job of explaining. Like I get it. It'd probably freak anyone out if they're taking a leak and they see a guy in a mask, steal their purse, but she had no reason to act as scared as she did though. Because unless it was turned out, Oh, she knows who Michael Myers is, but this is in the middle of nowhere. This is probably like Wyoming or no, I guess it was California by now. I think it said that. But still, California, Michael Myers was a national story. We get it. But 20 years later, would this woman know and have a reason to be afraid of Michael Myers? And says she just cowers down and hopes that he doesn't kill her daughter. Like I, I had a big problem with that bathroom scene. Um, I agree with what you said about Charlie being in this film to basically just be horny. I said already that I'm a big Adam Arkin fan. He also is big horny in this movie. And so was LL Cool J. Big horny in this movie. Like, Jesus Christ, man, these guys. Anyway, uh, that's fine. Who the hell trick-or-treats in broad daylight? That's a problem I have with a lot of movies. Like, these kids are just walking down the sidewalk at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, trick-or-treating, and in full o'clock. Like, why aren't you in school? Why aren't you in school? Uh, and then another thing, when she's in the restaurant, she's having her second glass of Chardonnay, which, hey, I feel you, girl. But uh, she's having her second glass of Chardonnay, and the dude dressed as the Grim Reaper. 
<laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, we've all been there. But uh, <laughs> the grim, the guy dressed as Grim Reaper is like chasing, playing with that girl down the sidewalk, and they just crash into a restaurant window. Has that ever happened to any of you all? Where you're sitting at a restaurant and someone just crashes in because they're playing on the streets? Like I think that's just that's laziness. This movie is full of jump scares, and I hate every single one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, outside this restaurant, when John and uh, Lori start arguing, <laughs> Josh Hartnett's voice cracks. And it cracks me up yeah. every time. I'm not responsible for you. It's like Jesus Christ. It and makes me laugh that, every and time. And they left that fucking that cut in of all the cuts they probably took. But actually, I'm I'm glad that they did though because it added some realism. Like he's a yeah, teenager. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. And he's Passionate in the moment, like my yeah. voice cracked when I was his age, but yeah, that's it was cool. funny. Uh, and then last thing that I have, Ronnie is just I get it. We all love LL Cool J. Ladies love Cool J. I, I get it. But he's a terrible security guard. Oh, he's yeah, not absolutely. top security guard of the world, Craig. He is a terrible security guard. He's not trying to be a good security guard either, though. <laughs> you gotta tell me that when uh, she pulls back up at the school and. You know, Lori's bitching at him because you let my son out, blah, blah, blah. And where were you? You you know, we've been sitting here trying to get you to open the gate. He didn't look right behind her and see Michael Myers in that rickety-ass SUV or truck, whatever the hell it was. Like, it was right there. He didn't even notice that. Mm -hmm. His awareness on Madden would be a negative four. What are you doing? That's your job. Your job is literally to be aware. And you didn't notice that. And that's going to come back to fuck you in a minute or fuck the whole school in a minute. So issues with that. Go ahead. All right. Uh, now we're, we get a ring at the dumb waiter, and Molly opens it up and John left flowers for her and a note. It's a map that leads to a surprise. She follows the map and John grabs her with the jump scare. Uh, yeah, you're right, Brian. There's way too many false jump scares in this movie. It's ridiculous. I wrote there's lights. There's a Halloween banner. There's a dinner table set up. He's never celebrated Halloween because of his mom. Lori is teaching class now, and Molly looks out the window, and we see another Michael out of the classroom window shot. Lori calls on her to answer a question. Lori stops John as class dismisses. She gives him a permission slip to go to Yosemite. He shows Molly the slip and chunks it because he ain't going. The buses load up to leave, and Lori runs out her house to go to the buses, but they're all gone now. She gets jump scared by Norma. It's Halloween. Everyone's entitled to one good scare in a meta line of her being maternal to her, showing comfort. Norma Norma tells her happy Halloween and drives off in the psycho car. Buses exit the gate and drive past the Myers car on the side of the road. Ronnie is on the phone again, and the Myers car parks out at the gate. Ronnie opens it up and checks it out because it's smoking. We see Myers enter the campus behind his back. Ronnie shuts the gate and tells his wife what happened, and we see Myers in the window behind him. Then the phone lines go out. He goes out to explore. Lori's walking home and she sees Michael walking to her, but thinks it's in her mind. And she thinks it's another illusion. And then Will jump scares her again. He wants to spend the night with her. Will then sees a shadow walk away. Will checks on Molly and Sarah. Then they have an awkward exchange about his nipples getting pierced. The boys sneak in and John hears a rustle. You know, they're, they're all sneaking back into the dorm, but John hears a rustle in the bushes, but he ignores it. All right, go ahead, Brian. It's the next two scenes I got. <clears throat> so I would like to say I love the chemistry between Hartnett and Michelle Williams. I think the uh, dialogue, I don't think it's forced, and their chemistry to me, I, I think, really feels natural. Um, actually, like we said, the dialogue through the whole movie, I think, is really good. And uh, I, let me point out that that Frankenstein line that Molly delivers to Lori in class, where it's like basically foreshadowing her own lifelong battle with Michael Myers and, and how it parallels that Frankenstein story she was talking about, I thought that's tremendous writing. You know, whether that was Williamson or Zappa's writing, doing, I, I don't know, but I, I thought that was great. Um, it, like you touched on, I love the Easter egg with Janet Lee getting in her exact car from the uh, from the movie Psycho. I thought that was a really nice touch, and uh, I didn't think that took you out of the movie to me. Um, but these scenes, to me, are a whole lot of blue balls. Like, you get all the tension built up with Ronnie, but then it's done, and it cuts away. You know, and it tries to just basically do the same thing with Lori. And now... You know, we kind of hinted about it earlier, but I know that there was a version of the script where Charlie was supposed to be a copycat killer. And I think that that makes a lot more sense knowing that. And then like and then you see where where Williamson tries to 
quote unquote cotton weary scream to the script and make will like the 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 red herring with all of these i'm seeing michael myers but then it turns out to be will every time like yep. in this scene and so that reminded me a lot of cotton weary and scream too yep. and uh you know I, i'm i'm gonna say real fast that i really actually really like that idea of uh, of charlie but we'll save it for the end when we kind of discuss that and um i actually don't mind you know we kind of discussed this a little bit earlier uh text message but i actually don't ground um you know it, it dates the movie but you know they dated the movie at the beginning when they said it was taking place in 1998 so i and and i get the meta if you think about it you know too much with the first one and watching halloween but it it doesn't really bother me personally one way or the other enough for me to really care about it so um that's all i got on those yeah i'm with you brian i like the uh chemistry between john and molly i think it's good uh i really really love that classroom scene and I know every Halloween has to have a classroom scene, and that's a trope. But I think it works really well here. The dialogue with the Frankenstein and everything that you mentioned. And I think the acting for Jamie Lee Curtis in that scene is great. Uh, being frozen in her tracks, you know, kind of taken aback. And if I'm not mistaken, Brian, in one of the scripts, this is also where they would kind of intertwine 4, 5, and 6 is in this set of scenes. Am I not right? Am I wrong about that? Um, th yeah, this, yeah, this is the, this is the deleted scene that I was talking right, about. I right. Believe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so, I mean, that would have even been, that, that would have been even cooler, but again, I really like the subtle nod to the first one where she looks out the window and sees Myers and she answers the question correctly and it stops Laura in her track. Just kind of some role reversal there. I think that's really cool. Uh, but hey, I like I, that, that kind of stuff though. But but that scene you're talking about wasn't in an earlier version of it. It was this script. Oh, and it okay. Was filmed, it was filmed in this one. They just cut it out. Okay. Okay. I mean, either way, I think I would like that scene a lot. But, uh, yeah, I, I really do like that. And I love the knob with Janet Lee. I think that's awesome. Uh, again, I, I love Meta, so I love little tips of the hat. Although I thought 2018 kind of did a little too much fan service. I think this gets it right. This, this isn't even a callback to the Halloween franchise. It's a callback to Psycho, which – you know, Halloween was very inspired by Psycho, as, as John Carpenter has said a million times. So it makes sense that they got the original car. I know that's a fun fact somebody, that, that somebody probably had later, but that's the original car from Psycho. That's awesome. I love that everyone's entitled to one good scare line. That's awesome. So there's a really, I, I really like that dynamic. If I could be maternal for a moment, haha, because it's her mom. That's funny. Uh, so, you know, there's some good stuff there. Um, and, uh, I think yeah, that's yeah, that's all I have. I I like the set of scenes. Nothing. Well, one thing I will say is I'm not a big fan of the love interest with Laurie Strode, and I know, like you mentioned, the red herring and stuff like that. But I'm I'm honestly not big on that because it doesn't really go anywhere. He's he's in this movie to die, and and when you're in a movie to die, I'm not a really big fan of that. You're kind of cannon fodder to me. Uh, I think you could have done without that, except, you know, like you said, it's very Scream 2. He's in this movie to be a red herring, and that's okay. I just felt like that's an unnecessary character when we could have just kind of, you know, shaved that off and not had it. But as far as Charlie being the killer, which I know was part of the original point of him being in this movie, a copycat killer, I think that could have worked if executed properly. It would have made the movie a little more interesting, but... Uh, it's not unnecessary, especially because, again, you know the copycat killer, Mike Myers, is killing that bitch. So, again, I don't know if, if it's 100% necessary because Char Charlie's going to die either way. Whether it's because he's big horny or because he's a copycat killer, either way, he's dead. So, uh, I, I like the set of scenes, especially that classroom scene. I really, really like that scene. I'm just thinking about how things would have worked themselves out if Ch Charlie was the copycat killer. Just imagine that him trying to play it cool with Mike, and then Mike's still chopping his head off like, nah, buddy, I still got to kill your ass. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I like I like the classroom scene, and then the relationship between John and Molly, that kind of, that, that was great for the movie, and then the the part about Molly kind of having her own thing with Michael Myers, that was, that was interesting in itself. And later on in the movie, the thing that kind of killed me was every time you thought Mike was going to pop up and we were getting some feel that Mike was around in the area, Will would always pop up. And that later on in the movie, that kind of is ironic when we'll get, we'll talk about that part later when somebody gets 
almost killed because of that same situation, but Will's on the other end of it. So it's kind of ironic that Will's always on the other side of it, and then later in the movie, it flips around. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't really get the relationship. I think if they're going to put him in the movie, at least make the relationship more intense. I don't, I don't know, like shit. His his ass was damn like he was annoying to me throughout the movie. I don't really get the reason for them putting him in the movie if they're going to just kill him off. Yeah, but, he doesn't serve a purpose to me either. So. Yeah, I don't really think he serves a purpose. He's just. A guy straddling, straddling around them, um, doesn't really know what the hell is going on, and shit, you knew his ass was gonna get killed. But yeah, that's just that's just my thoughts on everything. And we'll I don't really want to talk about that part till we get to it about when Will's popping out, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah, so I mean these these group scenes just more stupid jump scares that are unnecessary, uh, other than to I agree add that. horror elements, you know, to make you jump. Uh, I hate it. Michael seeing Molly was kind of pointless to me, or I'm sorry, Molly seeing Michael was kind of pointless to me when she's sitting in the classroom and she sees him out there because, again, she has no reason to be afraid of Michael Myers. So she just sees a guy in a mask. It's Halloween. And then she looks back and he's gone like that. That just, that didn't really do anything for me because she didn't say, she didn't go to, uh, she didn't go to John later and be like, hey, I saw this guy creeping around the gate or anything. Like, it was just kind of a pointless, pointless couple minutes there. Uh, that's okay, though. I feel bad for Lori. Like, she's really trying her best to keep her son and be a good mom. You know, she expressed the will that she's losing him. And then she comes back right here, even though he betrayed her trust and snuck out on lunch. Hey, here, I'm going to sign your permission, skip, permission slip. Go have fun. Like, she's trying to be a good mom. And then what's he do? He betrays her and almost gets himself killed. So, uh, you know, feel bad for Lori there. Uh, and you get another stupid jump scare with her walking into Norma there outside the building. I, I'm, I wrote down every time there's a jump scare. I have to say it. it pisses me off. And also, does does Ronnie live there? Is he the only security guard? Is he working a 24-hour shift? That motherfucker is there all damn day with no relief. So maybe I get it why he's such a bad security guard. Because, shit, he is highly underpaid. I don't care what they're paying him. He's underpaid if he's got to live in that little shack. <laughs> Relief call uh, in on me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> now, uh, had he done his job earlier, he would have noticed that that vehicle is the same vehicle. Like I said earlier, if he had just looked behind Lori and be like, hey, what's that rickety-ass SUV behind you? Oh, this is the same one that's at the gate. And then... He's just going to see a running vehicle and no one in it. The driver obviously went somewhere. So you're going to leave the gate open behind you so he can just sneak right in behind you? God, he's such a shitty security guard. And then uh, another, the last thing I have on these set of scenes is Michael spends a lot of time in these scenes kind of stalking Ronnie and just watching him. Like We get several scenes where Ronnie's in the shed and Michael's outside just looking at him, but there's no payoff. He didn't kill him ever. And so it was kind of just pointless to add suspense, but there's no payoff. So they could have just cut that from the film, in my opinion. Yeah, I was going to ask, why does Michael not kill him when he walks behind him? Exactly. I mean, doesn't it make it a lot easier to get to Laurie Strode <laughs> if you don't have a pretty strong looking guy out of the way and it's easy yeah. to just go ahead and knock him off? Yep. I just don't understand why he doesn't go ahead and take him out right then. Yep. All right, Lori, she pours a liquor drink and is going to town on it, and Will shows up. The kids are preparing a huge-ass meal for four people and have every candle in the city lit for their dinner. Charlie leaves to get the booze. Lori and Will are starting to get intimate, but she brings up her true, Id her true identity and tells of her story, but Will is more worried about getting it in instead of being the good listener he said he was at lunch. She tells him more about Myers killing her friends. She goes and makes him a drink, and they talk more. He asks if she thinks if he's still coming after her. She sees John's birthday card and runs to go call John, but the phone lines are dead. She goes in John's room, and his luggage is still there. She grabs a gun to go look for John, and Ronnie jump scares her as she opens her front door. They all split up. Sarah goes to find Charlie. He sneaks behind her and takes the dumbwaiter upstairs to get a corkscrew. Friday the 13th Part 4 nod, maybe? He drops it down the drain, and, and as he tries to retrieve it, but Myers appears behind him. Nice CGI mask. The lights flicker, and Sarah checks the dumbwaiter, and Charlie is dead with a, a slit throat. 
Michael appears behind her, and she tries to go up the waiter, but is stabbed. Then Michael cuts the rope, lifting her, and her leg is crushed as her leg stuck in the dumb waiter. John and Molly get concerned when they hear a crash. Sarah tries to crawl away, but Michael kills her with several stabs. John and Molly search the kitchen and find blood on the ground from the dumb waiter. They follow the trail and see Sarah's dead body hung from the ceiling with a light cord. They run outside when they see Myers. John and Sarah stop to talk for a second, and Myers appears. He stabs John's leg, and Molly hits his head with the rock. They run off and try and get into a dorm, but they drop their keys when they get inside the fenced-in entrance. Myers swipes his knife at them, but he can't reach. They beat on the door to let them in as Myers tries each key to unlock the door. Myers and Lori meet face-to-face -face through the window, the iconic scene of this movie. She gets her gun to shoot, but he's gone. Will asks who, was, who it was. Lori locks the kids in the closet. Will asks, what do we do? And Lori says, try to live. A shadow at the end of the hall appears, and he opens fire, but it was Ronnie. He's laid out, presumably dead. Myers appears and kills Will by stabbing his back and lifting him with a knife. Michael breaks down a closet, but Lori hits him in the head with a fire extinguisher, and she and the two kids run off. They get in the car and drive off as Michael almost grabs her. And the next two scenes are the ending. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I'm I'm completely with Dustin in agreement with the, the whole exchange and reveal uh, to Will from Lori just has has always made me cringe a little bit. It's just it's weird. It's awkward. Um, it's a weird time for her to decide to tell him that anyway. And then she gets frustrated with him for just wanting to have sex. Come on, Lori. Jesus Christ. Um, I do like the I'll be right back. Charlie gives us, you know, a little nod to scream right there. I, I do like that little touch. Um, and I do distinctly remember the, uh, the Charlie's hand in the sink scene in the theater and all the tension that was that was there. I thought that was good. But here we go. God damn it. The CGI mask. <clears throat> it doesn't even matter what happens next or honestly lack of what happens next. Um, because honestly, Charlie was supposed to actually have his hand all jacked up in that disposal. But once again, I kind of feel like we got censored. Um, and uh, but then again, right after that, we get a pretty good shot of Sarah's foot getting all jacked up. But then, boom, more off screen shit without the stabbing. So uh, I, I definitely get the uh, nitpicks there. Um, <clears throat> there's another shot of the mask here. And it's it's the it's the one with the with the hair that looks like some surfer dude. Um, I think it's the one Dustin's talking about. Look, I just that's that's one of my the, besides the CGI mask. That's the second worst one yeah. in this movie. And, uh, you know, also, look, I'm all for how Michael Myers has always just set people up to be found. I get it. Uh, Jason does it, too. But come on with the way that he hangs up Sarah with that elaborate light in her body in like 35 seconds. And, uh, you know, by the way, that lights holding her weight like that. I just to me that stood out and I, I hated it. I thought it was stupid. Um, you know, and I'm not I'm going to say this, but. We'll never get him on the show now. But I'm not a big fan of the guy who played Myers here. Um, look, sorry, Chris Durand. I'm just spoiled with the guys who have done it better in this franchise, and they feel more like Myers. Um, I just I don't like the way he moves. Like you have this scene uh, where, and and you have that scene with Hartnett, you know, punching Myers. That's another example of Myers and his quote unquote powers and strength that have fluctuated all throughout this franchise. But sorry, Chris Durand, like, you know, it's it's not your fault, but they've they've established how Michael Myers should walk, talk, and sorry, buddy, you're not it. Um, not walk and talk, but you know, walk and, and move. Um <clears throat> now look, this is probably my least favorite set of scenes up to this point, but it's saved right at the end. With, with Lori and Michael coming face-to-face -face at that door, which in that scene, the mask looks really good, I think. I mean, hell, it had to. It was the center point of the whole advertising like Nico kind of talked about. But this was one of the scenes that the producers interfered with because in the trailer, which I just watched a little bit ago, that exact scene is shown, and that's not the same mask they use here uh, in this final cut. So I'm kind of I'm really glad that they changed it. That one actually looked like a fifth mask, which God, you know, God knows. Um, and look, that's the kind of introduction to each other that I wanted in 2018. And I know this isn't 2018, but it's kind of like how I think it was Allison, right? That comes face to face with him right behind that gate. That reminded me of this movie and this scene. And in 2018, I just wished that it was Lori right there in that scene. But anyway, um, Lastly, look, Will's kill. I thought it was awesome. It's my favorite in, the, in this movie. 
And, uh, you know, then it just sets up the beginning of the of the next set of scenes, which to me is my favorite in the whole movie. So uh, that's all I have. Uh, yeah, I, I so the kills are are meh in this set of scenes, but I like a lot of what else is in these scenes. And I might be alone in this, but I like the some of the suspense and some of the very traditional Halloween stuff, the way that they. So, yeah, the CGI mask is here. It sucks ass. I've acknowledged that. But. I like the interact, like I like the Myers and Charlie back and forth. I think that's good. I I think e- even him and Sarah. Why I don't necessarily agree with the elaborate killing per se. I like the quote unquote chase there. You know, with the I I don't know what you call that. Is that an elevator? You know, whatever the fuck you want to call that. I like all that stuff. Like I think that's pretty good, pretty suspenseful. It's not jump scary to me like some of the other stuff in this movie. So I think while. The Myers masks throughout this whole set is really bad. Like the eyes are really big, and it it, it kind of takes away from it. I still like some of this other very Halloweeny stuff. I have no other way to describe it, but I think it's some pretty good slasher stuff. Um, like Brian and Dustin had mentioned, the reveal of Lori being Lori to Will is awful. It's awkward. I feel like there could have been a much better way to introduce the fact. To other people that this is Lori's throw, but the audience already knows. So I don't really know another way that you can do it other than maybe not while they're about to get their freak on. That's preferred. Maybe find another way to introduce a re reintroduce Lori Strode to everyone else. But I think that so so I like the will kill a lot. I think it's it's kind of scary. In a way, like, that's one way to go, man, is to have a nice stab in your back and you jacked up like that. Like, I think that's, this isn't a visual medium, but if you could have seen me, I I did the whole kill over again. But I think, <laughs> I like that kill. I think it's good. Uh, I think the quote-unquote kill of Ronnie is really good. Kind of like about what Freddie said, where uh, it's almost role reversal, where it's been Will this whole time that's kind of been the red herring, and then he ends up, you know, shooting Ronnie, which, man, I'm got I'll save her. For when we get there, but the iconic shot of them meeting in that mirror for the first time, I love that shot. It's great. My only nitpick, and I know I've said this a million times, but it, this scene highlights it more than any. Think of how much better that scene would be if they had gotten the mask right. That is a classic scene. If you could have had the Shatner mask or even the 28, hell, even the 07 zombie mask in that scene would have worked better. The, the mask kind of drags that iconic shot down for me, but I do like the fact that we get that actual interaction between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers. And in 2018, it, it was a little bit of a nitpick that you didn't get a really, really good reintroduction between the two. But in 2018, they're not siblings. In this movie, they're siblings. So Michael, in 2018, doesn't fucking know or care about Laurie Strode like that. She cares about Michael Myers. And so there is a little bit of a different character there but uh i i don't hate this set of scenes like well like i think uh some of you might because i like this suspenseful uh this suspenseful stuff but the kills are lame except for will i will say that that's just kind of a general thought about this whole movie so but like brian said we're about to get into my favorite set of scenes in this entire movie i'm also not a big fan of of this myers portrayal it it, it's not my least favorite for damn sure (laughs) that would be halloween five but uh, it's definitely not my favorite. So, yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, I, um, I'm with you. I, um, I hated the part where he hung Sarah up. Like, this whole narrative that Mike's this well-thought-out guy that practices arts and crafts, and then early in the movie, he just lets run. He just slide past him like he thought it out. Like, all right, I'm going to let this security guard live so that they don't know I'm here. Like, they know you're coming. So just go ahead and kill him. And they're just trying to make Mike like he's some mad genius or something. I don't really like that. Like, let's get to the savage stuff. Let him start slicing people up and let it let make it vicious. And the Charlie part, I didn't really like that scene. But the, the up and down on the elevator, that was it kind of got me some butterflies in my stomach a little bit. I'm like, shit, all right. It's getting a little real right here. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's getting a little real. And I'm completely with you guys on the guy that's playing Mike. Usually when you got Mike on TV, I don't know, it's just, it's different. Like, when I was a kid and I used to watch Halloween, 
I watched Halloween and I I didn't I couldn't stay home alone. Like I couldn't be in the dark. This guy, I could watch him anytime <laughs> during the day. Like he didn't put any fear in my mind. Like when I saw him walking, when he was chasing John and Molly, when they dropped the keys, I was like, "Yo, this guy's a joke, man!" Like who is this dude? Like, hey, I call him Mall Santa Michael Myers all the time. I mean, he he really is in this movie. It's he, he's a Mall Santa. He's not the real Santa. <laughs> like the he had a principal walk. Like, yeah, it's not scary at all, man. It's terrible. <laughs> and, and but the part with the keys, I'm like. Man, all right, it might come, but when they dropped those damn keys, part of me wanted to see Molly's ass get sliced up just for them doing that stupid ass shit. Like, God damn, you know, you know who's behind you. And then then they finally get the keys. I'm nervous as hell. And that face off, that was the part of the, all right, we've been waiting for this all movie. Now shit finna get real. But it was over yes. it had a lot of back and forth, but I don't know. Yeah, so the the guy that played uh, Michael Myers in this film, he actually said that he wasn't too familiar with the character beforehand, yeah. and he said, you know, it, it, he kind of is grateful for that because it's such an iconic that he would have been nervous. But I disagree, Bubba. You could be nervous, but you need to be more prepared. I agree with what you guys said. He he was not very good. No offense to him, because I'm sure he went on to do other things that were well, better. Well, you but. Know- you know, Durant, he was actually a stunt double for Ghostface in Scream 2. So, <laughs> if if he's playing him like he did Ghostface, meh. Yeah. Yeah. We get it, Nico. Uh, so, you don't like Ghostface. God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, uh, here's here's some things that, uh, something that I think they could have explored more. Lori having these little moments where she's seeing Michael Myers, then she closes her eyes, and he goes away. Like, th- that happened earlier in the film. And then here, when he's walking towards her and she closes her eyes and opens them, he's still walking towards her. She closes her eyes again, he's still walking towards her. I think that that's part of what could have been explored more with like her alcoholism or something, or because maybe not even alcoholism, because I've never been drunk where I start hallucinating people, but uh, they could have played it up a little more to where that's a bigger storyline, a bigger factor to where it's known that she's having these visions. That way, when Will does walk into frame and jump scare that makes more sense why she's so jumpy you know just, i don't know they could have expanded on that a little bit more uh could have done without seeing her baby bird some candy corn into will's mouth uh don't <laughs> really ever care to see that again uh, um thank you but, <laughs> but what i'm saying with the the reveal that that's really Lori, like yeah we know it as an audience mm-hmm. but he didn't yeah. So put yourself in Will's position. You've been intimate with this woman for however long they have. We I don't know that we found out or that we know or that it really matters. But he did say, I love you the way that you are earlier. So they're throwing the L word out there, at least casually. So think about you're intimate with this woman and you find out that her whole identity is a lie. So that's that's the reason why it bothered me so much. That's one of the reasons because... I feel like he would have been just like felt betrayed and be like, maybe even, oh, you're putting the whole school in danger if that's really your brother and all this. But instead, he's like, huh, so that's really your brother, huh? And that's it. Like, there's no need to even have the reveal then, I don't think, until after Michael shows up, maybe. But whatever. That's why I'm not a writer, I guess. Uh, We get another stupid jump scare with Ronnie at the door, and he almost gets his... Uh, he almost gets a bullet hole between the eyes right there with that gun, gun happy woman, trigger happy woman, but <laughs> that was okay. I I, th- I did think that was kind of funny because how quickly she got the gun out right there, but then and we have the scene and she can't get the gun out and he just disappears. Whatever. Uh, I wrote in all caps: CGI mask! Exclamation <laughs> mark. Come on, man! <laughs> Unserious dog franchise. shit. Unserious franchise. Jason Voorhees would never, but uh, oh, never. oh my fucking god, Jesus never. Christ. <laughs> fucking took a boat to man. Okay, anyway, sent, <laughs> sent he... that mother sent that motherfucker to space. Yeah, that's realistic. All right, hey, at least hey, he it had, wasn't a CGI mask. He had a real mask though. He had a real mask. Oh my god, even if he did look like Super Shredder, he was frozen he for get... two thousand years. That's realistic. How did he get downstairs so fast? He went from with Charlie upstairs. Yeah, yes. that's that's and walking past the window back downstairs <laughs> in no time flat. I mean, it was like cut scene. Oh, there he is. He's already downstairs. Um, 
And then, you know, when, when Molly's in the, the dumb waiter and I, her leg being trapped under his leg was not believable for me. Mm-hmm. Like, just pull a little harder. I mean, shit, he's dead. Like, he's not resisting. And, but also, I have an issue with Michael not just cutting the rope sooner. He could have cut the rope while she's in the dumb waiter and then just killed her however he wanted to. But uh, I guess it was maybe a little cat and mouse there. He wanted to play with his food before he ate it. Snap her leg off almost like that. Hold that on, was. He, he, hold on. Do y'all think that's a? This just came. Do y'all think that's a garage door? Scream one nod, maybe. Uh, maybe I, I mean that would have made me think about it if maybe it like actually chopped her in half or like you stopped her there. But I don't know. Maybe. That that I just came. I don't know. If, I don't know if that's a nod at all. But it just made me think of it. Yeah, I mean. Uh, there's there's several nods to screen. Like I said, that could be open to interpretation. I just took it as I was just annoyed that he didn't just cut it while she was in the dumb waiter to anyway. But that mm-hmm. was a nasty ass breaking her leg. Uh, and, like I, I thought that the effects were well done on that, how it looked mm-hmm. afterwards. Uh, then we get outside, and when John is, you know, kind of tussling with Michael there to try to get get away. The sound effects on those punches were fucking ridiculous. I don't know if that bothers y'all, but there's hey, several gosh. things in this film that the sound effects are awful. Like when Michael's just, he pulls his knife, he moves his knife four inches, and it sounds like he's swinging a goddamn samurai sword. And then the punches here, it sounds like you're watching the uh, like uh, 1970s Scooby-Doo and like the punch sound effects. I was just waiting for it to pop up on the screen. Bam! Pow! Because it was ridiculous. Hated it. Um... Now, another thing. Why is Ronnie just walking around so quietly? Yep. Like, so this is what Freddie's talking about, how he almost got himself killed because of, you know, it, the tables were turned. Will was the one that was doing the jump scares. Well, now Ronnie walks around the corner and he almost gets shot in the face. If you're a security guard and you know that the perimeter's been breached and you know some shit's going down, maybe don't just walk around a corner all quietly like that unannounced. And if you see a shot get fired missed because – Clearly missed the first one, at least clearly missed. Yell, hey, it's me. But no, he just sat, he just became mute all of a sudden and got himself shot in the head. So, whatever. Um, and then I hated the way that I, I get what you're saying about you like the way that Will, you like Will's death, but I actually I hated the way he just nonchalantly with one arm just picked him up off the ground, no effort at all. And he lifts him above his head. Hold on. You guys want Michael Myers to be badass. And you guys love Jason and how he does all that same stuff. But he does this one badass thing where he picks somebody up by one arm. And now it's not believable. Well, which one is it? You know, I like to pick and choose what I want to believe. So why don't you just shut the hell up? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's I have no good comeback. Sorry, man. Yeah. I guess I am a little bit of a hypocrite. That's fine. So am I. It's I okay, just, buddy. I could but believe also, Tyler Maines, Rob Zombie, picking him up one hand. This guy, yeah. I can't do it. This guy's shorter than Adam Arkin looks like. That's that's part of the reason. That's the, then, that's but, how the original Myers looks. But that's that was my problem. That's what I said with his his strength fluctuates this entire fl- I franchise. I agree with that. His James yeah. Jude Courtney is strong as fucking shit in 2018, and I I complained about that too for a 70 year old man almost. So like. You know, it's it's. I don't. I wish that it was one way or the other. So I I, I get where you're coming from, Dustin, for sure. But I mean, if, I would if, rather if, it be one way or the other. Yeah. Even if we're even going with him, super strong, I liked it. Even within one film, because the way that he oh, goes yeah. down in the yeah. next scene, a woman. Yeah. No offense to you know women, but this frail woman has been through hell and back in this film, and for the past twenty years, just pushes him over a balcony. Yet he was able to pick a full grown man up with one arm with a knife in his back. And I did think it was funny the way Adam Arkin uh, overacted in that death. Like he was convulsing, he was shaking. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, but I'll never say anything <laughs> bad about Adam Arkin. So he, he, he deserves uh, an Oscar for that performance right there. Um, a Razzie. <laughs> uh, let's God. not go that far. I'm just kidding. Let's not Actually, go that far. Yeah, he, 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 he's not great here. <laughs> Come on. But anyway, that's all I got on these scenes. All right, the next two scenes are the Not scared of water, though. All right, anyway, let's go. (laughs) Okay. Uh, She opens the gate and tells Ma... And this is something I did not know, honestly, until I read IMDb uh, trivia, you know, the fun facts part. She opens the gate and tells Molly to drive to the Beckers, another nod to screen. 
uh, go to the Baker's house to call the police. She gets an axe and goes after Myers. She goes back into the dorm, and he descends behind her, and they exchange knife and axe blows. She hides under some tables. Friday the 13th, part two nod, perhaps. Uh, she hides underneath some tables, but Myers is on top of it, waiting on her. She distracts him and takes off. She grabs a flag and stabs him with it, and she runs into the kitchen. She throws knives at him, then uses the drawer as a guard from his stabs. He follows her into the hall, and she jumps out of hiding and stabs him repeatedly, and he, she, he, she knocks him over the balcony onto a table. And I hate this part. She goes to give him one last super slow stab after she was going full you know, ninja on him with these stabs, but now it's super slow. She goes to give one last final stab, but Ronnie somehow is still alive and grabs her saying, he's dead, he's dead. Ronnie tells his wife on the phone he's, ro- he's writing a romantic thriller. Lori steals a cop's gun and hijacks the coroner's van to steal Michael's body. As he drives, Michael starts to awake and break out of the body bag. She slams the brakes and throws him out the windshield. He's not dead and sits up Undertaker style, so Lori hits him and they drive off a cliff. Michael is pinned between a tree and the flaming van. She grabs the axe from the ground and walks to him and calls his name. Michael reaches for his mask to try and remove it, then reaches towards her, and she reaches toward him. She smirks, then swiftly chops his head off with the axe, and then the Halloween score and end credits roll. Go ahead, Brian. That's the ending. Yeah, so I actually, I loved that little Becker's uh, call back there to Scream 2. Um, but, uh, and this is what I meant by my favorite scene, like, just that moment where Lori turns away from that gate after locking herself in there with that axe and is just fucking walking up that hill with that axe and that Halloween music starts playing while she's screaming for Michael, like, it gives me chill bumps. I, I fucking love that scene. Um, the mask in these fight scenes, at least, the beginning where they're exchanging blows and then she's hiding under the tables, I think the mask looks really good right there. Um... I'm not real sure how someone gets on a table, by the way, without making any noise whatsoever, but whatever. Um, him throwing those tables over, looking for her, I thought was a very good visual. Um, uh, Lori, uh, Lori's, you know, going to Lori, though, and, and make some dumbass decisions, like like Nico kind of alluded to. And uh, come the fuck on with that groin kick and that fucking stupid fucking Myers eyes and his stupid big-ass eye-hole mask rolling cartoonishly in the back of his head. Like, <sighs> anyway... But I love how she's hiding and goes, uh, you know, goes just start hacking away on him uh, the way you know, until she until he falls off the balcony, like, you know, kind of mirroring the end of 78 there. So I did like that little end there. Um, all right. So we get to the end here where firstly, I mean, you know how I am about putting someone in a corner's bag with a damn mask on. I've said the same thing about chasing movies. Um, it bothers me. Uh, like I said earlier, though, you know, Charlie is supposed to be a copycat killer and then gets killed, you know, by the real Myers, I believe, at the end um, in the in the earlier drafts. But apparently everyone wanted this to really be Myers. And to me, it is because to me, this is the end of the timeline. And I know Jamie Lee Curtis wanted this to be the end of it and her to chop his head off. Um, a cod, I, th- I think, wanted or is it? A, I think it's a cod. Uh, you know, wanted to make more movies. So he went to Williamson and they came up with this little may or may not be Myers here. And if the movie performs, they'll just make it someone else. But to me, I kind of relate this to, I don't know, Star Trek two, for instance, where they killed Spock, like in Star Trek two, Spock is dead. What they do after that doesn't really affect that. And, you know, this end scene with Michael, like reaching out for Lori, that's so effective because, because it's Michael, like you, you have that emotional connection there. Uh, so to me, like what they chose to do afterwards to me doesn't change this at all. Like if a cod was so hung up on wanting to do another one, no matter what, then, you know, I, I think they should have gone with the Charlie being a copycat killer and, and then, you know, being killed by the real Myers at the end. Like they said, like, I think that this is a solid ending of the entire timeline. And to me, like, honestly, you know, resurrection doesn't change this one. Um, it's like, and Nico will get this reference like tomorrow or Thursday, but it's honestly like back to the future too. Because it's like you, you knowing stuff that's going on in the background of Back to the Future One, just because it was in Part Two, doesn't yeah. change. It doesn't change Back to the right. Future One to me. Um, so and and you know Curtis finally gave in. You know and we got what we got. On, you know, but she's like on record according to HorrorGeekLife.com, which is which is this is probably why Nico hates Jamie Lee Curtis even more. But she's gone on record, you know, saying resurrection to her was a quote unquote joke. And she was only in the movie because she was contractually, you know, uh, obligated to. So to her, H2O is the end of this original timeline. And to me, it is, too. 
Um, even though, you know, we've talked about it, there's a lot of good in Resurrection, but this was meant to be the ending and nothing in that movie, again, affects this one to me. Right. I, I, I like, I already said it. I love this ending set of scenes. I think the, the quote unquote standard chase scene between Michael and Laurie is really good. Uh, it is a little long, but I don't think it's bad. I think that the stuff with her being underneath the table and all that, I like that stuff. I like some of the classic throwback lines too, like, you know, go to the Beckers, do as I say, which she repeats in 2018 a million times. But again, when we, when you watch 2018, H2O is not supposed to exist. So, you know, that's kind of uh, neither here nor there. I like that stuff, those subtle callbacks. And I like that she, this is, I like that in this movie, Lori is more vulnerable. This is where she throws all that aside, takes charge, gets in the van, and does exact you know, takes over the corners van, does exactly what she's supposed to do. Um, I I know a lot of people don't like this stuff when he, uh, she she runs over Michael and drives him you know into the mountain and smushes him and all that stuff. But I I really like it. Now I all I also say. The mask is very bothersome in this scene. It's really, really bad to see his eyes like they like it is. The mask really takes away from this movie. I do feel like this is a good set of scenes. I don't think it makes any sense to have somebody else in that Michael Myers outfit. Um, and I get it. It's just a way to kind of do another movie. I feel like there's a better story there they could have told. And I'm fine with Resurrection existing. I like the concept of Resurrection, just not the movie. Uh, and I don't necessarily understand why they had to kill off Laurie Strode to get that. You could have just made another movie. Like, this should have been the end of the Laurie Strode timeline. I don't think those two needed to connect at all. I think you could have just done Halloween Resurrection without that opening scene with Laurie Strode. It might have been a better film. Uh, there's no reason, there's no need to retcon this in. But as far as this movie, I think, uh, I enjoy this last set of scenes. I think it's intense. It's very, it's what we want when we watch a Laurie Strode versus Michael Myers movie, which is that final class, we're finally getting it. Is this as good as what 2018 did? No, I love the final battle and Halloween 2018. I think it's fucking awesome, but I think this is pretty good. And I like that. She takes his head clean off, even though it's kind of looks ridiculous uh, because of the eyes being so big, but I think it's good. I like some of the subtle callbacks and I, and, and I really do like the stuff in the, I guess that's a cafeteria with the tables and stuff. I think it's really good. So job well done. Probably my favorite set of scenes, just because this is when we finally get Lori versus Michael. And that's kind of what we've all been waiting for at this point. Yeah. Um, I love the final scene of the movie. I think the only thing that kind of conflicted the ending was them making the resurrection. And that kind of confused everything. At the end of the day, I love, Lori, like you said, she was vulnerable in all all this movie, but at the end she was like, "Fuck that! I'm tired of running. I'm tired of running for Michael. I'm finna go kill his ass." And then the thing that was ironic when the scene when Michael comes down hanging from the ceiling, and then later on Lori comes down hanging from the ceiling and stabs his ass. That shit was always funny to me. But the end, the end part where I'm more conflicted with this, the ending because they made the resurrection. So I think it's a great ending, especially the part with Michael reaching out to her. But when I think about Resurrection and I come back to that, it's just hard for me to think, like, all right, this guy is getting his voice box. Because the way he was interacting with her in the car, he was trying to kill us. Like, that, he wasn't sorry, reaching out for help. Like, he was trying to kill us. So I think they kind of confused that whole ending when they made a Resurrection, especially when you think about the part where Michael's reaching out to her on the ceiling and shit, just like the guy was at the end. Like, how do you know he even did that? So I don't know. That kind of conflicted everything, but it was good ending. Yeah, so when we get the showdown, I love how she hits him in the chest with the axe because it really reminded me of when Dick got whacked in The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> same, same situation, but Michael's you tough on the purpose. <laughs> That one, he, that one didn't take him down. Uh, and then you're telling me she's not drunk. Like she's been drinking all day. Oh, she chugged hammered, the buddy. shit out of that vodka. Lori's here. Yeah, hey, yeah, she's got some so, tolerance. She's not a rookie here. She's got some tolerance built up. That's, that's true, but damn. Uh, <laughs> and then how does she not notice him getting on the table? That she like she's under the table, yeah. and he's just like on top of it. She didn't hear a thing. So yeah, I, I had an issue with that. 
Her throwing the uh, broken flagpole at him just made me laugh because she already stabbed him with it and broke it off in him. And then she just throws the rest of it. It did absolutely no damage, but the way that she threw the other half of the flagpole really made me laugh. Uh, and then she goes in the kitchen, and here's here's a couple things. Number one, why do you dump all the knives on the floor? Number two, she's the worst <laughs> knife thrower in the history of the world, so maybe she is drunk. Because you're going to tell me that from three yards, you can't throw a knife in it. It, it. You may not stab him with it, but you can't hit him at all with it. you just throwing it over his head from three yards. James Blackman on the, with throwing knives. Anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, and then, you know, she stabs him and pushes him off the balcony. And he goes straight through the Spanish announce table. But then she just drops her weapon. Like, he's clearly survived worse shit than that and then she just like oh i'm gonna drop my knife and go down and check on him no come on what are you doing um and then yet another stupid jump scare because ronnie's back from the dead apparently and it's just uh you know she's about to stab him and the way that she's all dramatic and how she's going to stab him you can tell something's about to happen and then oh it's ronnie i don't know he's dead he's dead who the hell cares if you know who this is let her stab him some more it cannot hurt uh, and then, you know, they go outside and they're out by the, the ambulance and the, and the cops and everything. Ronnie, read the room, my man. This woman has just been through an, a, a traumatic experience. And you come out here all excited talking on the phone to your girlfriend. I'm going to be a thriller, uh, thriller romance writer. No, nah, the bullet just grazed me. Everything's good. You got too much energy. Like, even if you're fine, she's not. Come on, tone it down a little bit. Uh, and then... Where was she planning on taking them in the van? Like she just like loaded up and she just starts haul assing down the road. But what was her what was her end game there? You got far enough away from it, like it's clear they're not following you. You have enough time if you want to pull over and stab him some more and make sure he's dead or whatever, but whatever. And then the the craziest part about maybe this whole movie is because okay, let's say Michael does have some supernatural strength and ability and everything. Lori doesn't. And she just went through a hell of an automobile accident, got thrown from the van. I don't know how she walked away from it at all, but then she has enough strength to hit a 450 foot home run with his head by swinging that axe. Like she hit a grand slam with no, like there was no struggle at all. She swung that axe like it was nothing. Axes, I don't know if y'all y'all ever swung axe, but I'm a wood chopper from way back. Axes ain't really that light. And then the way she just sl- swung it and knocked his head clean off, come on, that's the most unbelievable shit to the whole thing. But then you 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 are you you guys brought up resurrection. I wasn't going to because I was gonna. I like to view this is a this is the end of the timeline. <laughs> this is it. So resurrection didn't happen to me. Uh, I'm sure we'll eventually review it and then I can really unload on it. But for now, for the end of this movie, she cut his head off. And it's, it's a it's a nice bow on the three movies that are 78, 81, and H two O. I want to say before we go any further, I'm okay with Resurrection existing. I just don't like the fact that they tied it into this movie. But I'll wait until we review Resurrection to get into that more. I, I agree with you. No, we'll probably get into it in a little bit, Mike. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, and we got a couple of fan. Y'all got any final thoughts on the ending? Uh, I mean, I'll talk about it whenever we jump into the Akkad issue with the these two movies. Okay, let's jump into. We got two questions from uh, Shan on Facebook. It, it was one about Charlie. Originally, they were going to have Charlie be a copycat killer who was terrorizing the school and then get killed by the real Michael at the end. Do you think this storyline would have played out well? Especially, and she put this in uh, parentheses especially given the issues with the retcon that occurred with the end of the movie during the beginning of resurrection. Yo, I, I, I don't, I don't like that idea. Honestly, this is I mean, a Halloween I, movie. Not I, I a screen touched movie. On it. Well, I mean, I touched on it. I yeah. actually think it would have been a good idea if you, you were for sure going to leave Michael Myers alive. Yeah. I don't like what they did. So, you know, if this is not going to be the end of him and you are for sure going to continue with it, I like the idea. Well, I, yeah, it, but like you mentioned earlier, Brian, you can't use this actor. He's way too small. You got to get a bigger guy, I think. That guy's not right oh, for... Yeah. If yeah, he, he's, if not, he was a, he's not right for any part of this goddamn movie. <laughs> no, no. I don't, have, I don't have a problem with horny Charlie, but like Michael Myers wannabe, no, nah, you, 
He's got to be a little bit bigger. He needs right. to be like Freddy size or something. Hey, he can be horny all he wants. Right, but he, you got, he ain't fooling her. You guys got to remember the original Nick Castle, Michael Myers is not big at all. So this is how Michael, this is the size of Michael Myers. I mean, I don't really see why he needs to but, be big. But, but Nick Castle big. looks bigger than Chris Duran does to me. No, and I meant the actor who played tall. Charlie. Yeah, the actor who played Charlie doesn't seem as big as Nick Castle. And I don't mean tall, I just mean like stout. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Yeah. yeah, I like I the idea. Could, yeah, I was going to say, I think they could have done some. I'm, I'm not going to fully discount it because I don't yeah. know what the what the end product would have been. Uh, it could have been better than this. It could have been worse than this. But uh, I would have, I would at least entertain the idea. And I think that, honestly, that's how, to me, you could type, make Resurrection even better, though, is have it be a copycat killer where they're both killing, but not have Michael be the one that kills Charlie. Lori cuts his fucking head off, and then they realize, oh shit, that's not him. He's still out there. That's how you could continue the storyline if you wanted to. But... That would have been much better than the paramedic. Yes, I agree, I, yeah. I agree with that 100%. And one thing, the only... I actually like the copycat killer idea. My only issue with it is it's very <laughs> Scream, and this movie already has enough Scream influence, and to add that on top of it would have been almost a direct damn ripoff. And I know Kevin Williamson was had his hands in this, so it makes a little sense. But this movie already gets enough criticism for being scream light or scream ish, and I just think a copycat killer would have went right into that. So I don't think it would have been necessary. But I would have liked to see how the end product ended up with it, because like you just, I'd never thought of that, Dustin. That's a much better way to get Michael Myers back in Resurrection than what they actually did at the end of H two O. That would have been very a lot, lot more interesting. Yeah, but you got to write this movie totally different. To do oh, that. no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. That ain't no problem. That ain't no yeah. problem. I'm about to say, hey, there ain't no problem over <laughs> this way. You leave the classroom scene and start uh, replacing everything else. I'm good. Let's go. Hey, Freddie, you got any uh, comments on a Charlie copycat, or you want to go on to the next one? Yeah, I think um, if it was written differently, it would have transitioned smoother, like they were saying, into the resurrection. It just, it just didn't make sense, but they could have made it work if it, everything was gelling together, but it just... It would have had to transition transition smoother for resurrection. That's my that's my biggest thing with this movie. If it it didn't resurrection didn't really tie into this movie, so that would have made a little more sense going into resurrection. But I the whole so, yeah. movie yeah. would have had to be scripted scripted differently. All right. The, the second question she has, and I agree with you, Freddie. Uh, second question: Which version of Laurie Strode do you think played out better? In parentheses, more understandable. This alcoholic hiding away from Haddonfield or the survivalist version that we get in the 2018 version. Uh, I'll go first real quick. I, I like the 2018 version better, honestly. Uh, I, I think it, it makes it really the survivalist makes the more badass Lori plausible at the end because she's like terrified this whole movie. Then all of a sudden she's like beating the shit out of Michael, you know, as soon as they see each other. But she's been terrified the whole movie. And, I mean, 2018, she's scarred, but you see her gun. You see, like, the traps in the house, all the guns, the the target range. I just feel like 2018 pl- explained it a little bit better. Uh, Brian, Mike, Dustin, Freddie, y'all got any comments on that? Yeah, I'm going to give a cop-out answer because, honestly, I think you got to have a perfect mix of both. I think yeah, two. I, I do, I too. Think I think that they are both too extreme, and mm-hmm. I think that they tried to make 2018 so extreme because they tried to do that here, and it didn't quite work, and so they went way, way in that direction. So I think that uh, this is my favorite portrayal uh, of her playing Lori because I think it's closer. It's not perfect because there's a lot of aspects of 2018 that should have been in here that you guys have touched on with her alcoholism, like played up more but i think it's played up too much and almost to a clown level in 2018 now when she's the survival part i love that part but you know i mean i like i said i think that there's a a a, a middle ground there that we don't have i agree with that brian that's literally my thoughts <laughs> is i think a mix of both would have been great and that is a cop-out answer so i'll give an actual answer i actually like this lori more but i don't not like the 2018 Lori, if that makes sense. Like I, I, I think both portrayals are really good. My my only thing with this one is I think they I like the character of progression. They talk about Frankenstein in the classroom and you kind of get that same 
progression played out here with Lori, where she's kind of scared, scared, and then she like overcomes her fear, and that's when she becomes a badass. So I think the character progression works here. You don't necessarily get that in 2018. Like you don't see the alcoholism. Like I in both movies, I just wish they would have maybe delved deeper delved more deep into her being scarred but kind of like brian said my real answer is a nice mix of both because i really do like halloween 2018 Lori, just being you know a total badass but it is almost sarah connor-esque and i don't really know if that's necessary but a a nice mix of both would have been perfect yeah i mean i kind of i can't really pick because this one works for this script and yeah. 18 works for 18. So it's kind of like, which do I prefer? I like 18 is a better movie. So yeah. I'm going to have to side with that one. But I think that this one had a lot more potential. Like I said, if they had just tweaked it, exploited that alcoholism storyline a little bit more, uh, re- made it more prevalent in the storyline and in her character arc, then it could have been a hell of a lot better. This movie would have been a hell of a lot better. Uh, this movie was kind of just fell flat on some of their promises, if you will. Brady, I'm gonna roll with um, it was I was back and forth on this one, but I'm gonna roll with 18. I know you like the vulnerability in this one to know her overcoming the fears, but in 18, I don't know. I just love the fact that shit, she was looking for him and he was looking for her, and that shit was gonna be a war when they met. That's I love that whole script with that one in. It was like it's a better movie, and I don't know. I just eighteen was eighteen was one of my favorite ones in the series, so I'm gonna roll with that one. Yeah, I definitely think eighteen's a better film. There's no doubt about that, in my opinion. But all right, y'all ready to jump into some fun facts? Uh, Brian, do you want to go first, brother? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, I want to say there's also another early Halloween Seven idea, which had Jamie Lloyd had survived her appearance in Six which honestly that seemed like a pretty final death to me. And, uh, you know, in turn, this movie would like, you know, cultivate with Laurie Strode returning to save her daughter's life towards the end. Um, this actually was pitched by Daniel Farrens. I want to give him credit there. Um, Zapia, the credited writer on H2O, uh, was tapped to helm the original Halloween 7 called Two Faces of Evil, which was uh, in the vein, honestly, of Silence of the Lambs, where there's some help in the detectives try to catch Michael Myers. Um, at this point, they were actually going to go the straight to video route like Hellraiser um, at this point in time. But then uh, Bob Weinstein uh, approached JLC and kind of, the, you know, the rest was this. And uh, the last thing I have is I wanted to I wanted to read that scene that I was talking about that got cut um, that I referred to earlier. Uh, it involved uh, Sarah, Jody Leno Keefe's character, student at high school with Laurie Strode uh, in that classroom scene. Um, Sarah gives a class report on the Haddonfield murders, um, going into great detail about Jamie Lloyd, um, you know, obviously Laurie Strode's daughter from four and five. But Sarah mentions Jamie losing her parents in a car accident and was explanation of these sequels for Laurie Strode's, you know, absence. Her, her report chronicles Jamie being hunted and eventually killed. Um, you know, and upon hearing this oral presentation in the classroom, uh, Carrie like retreats to her uh, restroom and vomits. Um, obviously, Williamson's challenge was, you know, to create like an explanation for Laurie's death in the previous movies um, while keeping the continuity. And he came up with Laurie faking her own death and getting into the witness protection, you know, so, which 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 stayed in the movie. Um, so that's all I have. I like a lot of that stuff, too. And I know we're. I know we're kind of reading the same book at the same time, Brian. So shout out to the Taking Shape authors uh, whose names are slipping me. I know one is Dustin McNeil, but both books that they did about the Halloween franchise. One is just, you know, the history behind it. And this new one, the Taking Shape 2, is about all the unmade sequels. Uh, yeah. And I, I know a lot of that's in that book. And and it's great. <laughs> it goes into really, really deep detail with that particular script. And I, I, I don't hate that idea, uh, but I also don't love that idea, if that makes sense. So. I mean, if you like all the Thorn stuff, that makes sense, but I don't necessarily need it in my movie. But I love the character of Jamie Lloyd, so it's a toss-up. Well, I don't hate the Thorns. I mean, I don't love it like you guys think I do, but honestly, I don't hate <laughs> I don't hate it like drastically like you guys do. So to me, it's just all right, it's fine. It's just a part of the part of the story when they're trying to do something different, and I like it. Um, and Travis Mullins is the name of the other author. And yeah, I haven't read Taking Shape One, you have, but I am interested in the whole like Lost sequels, which is all Taking Shape Two is about. So I can definitely recommend that book for sure because I love 
you know, heck, I did that little write up on the uh, Rob Zombie episode about the what if to, you know, the follow up to resurrection uh, because that stuff intrigues me. So if, if it intrigues you, you need to go look into these books for sure. All right. I just got a few fun facts. Uh, this movie and how these are all from IMDb. This movie and Halloween Resurrection are the only two movies to show Michael not getting shot. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis has played Laurie Strode in films released in five different decades from the 1970s to the 2010s. Halloween 78, Halloween 2, 81, H2O and 98, Resurrection 2002, and Halloween 2018. That's very impressive. Uh, you know, this is another quote that she had where, I, I mean, she, even if she hates uh, Resurrection, I guess she doesn't have the best feelings about this movie as well. Uh, during a 2018 interview with Variety, Jamie Lee Curtis said H2O started out with best intentions, but it ended up being a money gig. The film had some good things in it. It talked about alcoholism and trauma, but I ended up really doing it for the paycheck. Uh, I got some other uh, IMDb facts. You know, it's just a, it's basically about how difficult Mustafa Akkad is, honestly, with yeah. uh, the ending of the with with the future of the Myers character. Well, which which was Jamie Lee Curtis's problem with this film completely? That's what frustrated right. her, I think, to the point oh, where yeah. she said that. I, if, I, I watched the H two O documentary today while at work. Don't tell my employer. <laughs> uh, but you know, the writers, the directors, they were all stressed out about this because they all wanted to go in a certain direction. Right. But Akkad, you know, he didn't want to go in this direction. So they like I read one ending where uh, Williamson wanted to kill him with a helicopter rotor. They had one ending where the bus falls down a giant steep hill. Uh, there's another ending where he's impaled with a javelin in the middle of the gym floor with retractable tiles or whatever. Uh, so I know we get into this big debate about the ending of this movie and the the beginning of Resurrection. I don't blame the director or the writers, Kevin Williams. I don't blame any of them. I blame solely Mustafa Akkad because uh, Kevin Williamson's hands were tied in this movie, I think. The only problem I really do have with the end of this, I, I, I wish they would have just made it where Michael would have just died when the van pins him against the tree. Just don't have don't have him reaching for his mask. That because that really just ruins the whole ending to me. Because Michael is supposed to be just pure evil, like John Carpenter said. Correct. He's not going to reach out to Lori now. He's not going to, you know, like Brian mentioned with Jason and Freddy versus Jason. His eyes, Michael's eyes, look emotional at the end when he's reaching right. towards Lori. I don't I don't like that. If you just have him die at the end where he's pinned in the between the tree and the van, and then Lori just says, fuck it, I, I hate this guy, and cuts his head off anyways, I, mean, I, I would be fine with that ending. But the whole reaching for the mask is what really bothers me. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I blame Akkad. I don't blame the other writers because Kevin Williamson's proven he's very talented. Uh, Steve Miner, the director, did part two and three of, Hall of Friday the 13th, excuse me. So he he, I mean, he has knowledge of what he's doing too. So, I mean, I get a cut. It's all about the money. That's what life's all about, making them Benjamins. But you really, you really, this would have been a great ending to the yeah. original timeline. I agree. But you wanted more money, and then you made a movie that, outside of me, nobody likes it. <laughs> <laughs> and you made the star, one of the stars, the biggest, well-known final girls of all time, Jamie Lee Curtis. You. <laughs> You made her look like a fool in the next one. She's a crazy person and all right. that. So, so I think he he really he really messed it up uh, by being greedy, honestly. So right. uh, that's just that's just my I, I want to be fair and balanced with my frustrations with the ending and the beginning of these two movies. I think that's fair. I'm not right. you know I don't I don't blame Williamson. But uh, uh, do y'all got any final thought or final fun facts before we jump into the uh, rating? Uh, yeah. So quick thought about. Uh, uh, quick thought about a cod. He did that a couple times in, uh, throughout this franchise. He's the reason that five got rushed and the reason that it ended up being so bad. And so he, he, he's a repeat offender and look, I know he's no longer with us and without him, we don't have 1978 Halloween. So I want to, you know, be fair and very balanced here. You know, he's still the grandfather of the franchise and, you know, rest in peace. Him and his you know daughter died in a terrorist attack in Jordan. And so that was, you know, that is sad in and of itself. But like you said, he is. He, he, he was two hands on in this franchise, and I agree with you 100%, Nico. Uh, one more fun fact. I don't think I heard anybody talked about it. Our girl, Danielle Harris, lobbied her ass off to get a cameo in this movie, uh, had her agent call the people and everything, and uh, they told her no, and she didn't get it. So I will give Rob Zombie 
a tip of the cap for giving Danielle another role within the Halloween uh, franchise because I think it would have been cool. I know that we don't love the whole playing another character in the movie, but I think it would have been fun to see Daniel a grown up, a more grown up Danielle Harris in this movie somewhere as a cameo. Um, this movie had a seventeen million dollar budget and made seventy five million dollars worldwide. So uh, there's a reason Halloween Resurrection was made right there. Oh yeah, it did really well for the the box office. Go ahead, well, Dustin. Considering after six they were about to go straight to VHS, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't have any. You guys said them all. All right, let's uh let's jump into our favorite kill, least favorite <laughs> kill in the rating. Uh, just going to give a quick shout out to Manscaped. It's brought to you by them. Uh, go to manscaped.com. Use our code Don't Go for twenty percent off and free shipping. Just use our code Don't Go. Freddie, you're the guest. Do you want to go? Do you want to go last tonight? With the uh, favorite kill, least favorite kill in the rating? Yeah, I'll go last. Okay. Uh, does anybody in particular want to go first? I'll go I'll first. Go, go ahead, Mike. I'll go All after right. you. Okay. Uh, my favorite kill is Will. Uh, my least favorite kill is, like, the majority of the other kills, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't really like any of the other kills in this movie, uh, except for the skate kill that's off screen. So, not a great movie as far as the kills go. The MPAA or somebody hacked this movie to death. I don't know if they just didn't want to fight for the gore or what. But, yikes. Uh, I do like the Will Kill a lot. Um, okay. My rating is really weird with this movie because sometimes I love this movie because it's quick. It's very. It's got some good Halloween elements. I already repeated all that. It's got Jamie Lee Curtis. I love her portrayal. There's a lot that I like. I nitpicked it to death. Kind of like I did Halloween 07 where... I nitpicked that movie to death, but I ranked it really high in my rating just because it's so nostalgic for me. I don't have that same nostalgic pool for this movie as I, I saw it later on in, in life. I saw it after I saw Halloween 07. So the nostalgia isn't quite there for me, but it is very of its time. I like the scream aspects of this movie. And so with all that being said, I rated this movie a 7. I gave it a flat 7. Um, I think it's really good. I There's a part of me that almost went 7.5. But after a rewatch, it kind of brought it down some for me uh, because the kills and I hate calling them the kills, but it is what it is. Uh, the kills in this movie are flat and it, it it drags it down and the mass, all of them suck ass, except for the one in the opening scene, which is from Halloween six. All right, my favorite kill, I chose Sarah and uh, I said mostly because of the leg break that that. Oh, God, yeah, you talk, you talking about awful feeling. I would hate that. Uh, my least favorite, it's hard to disagree with Mike picking pretty much all of them, but I picked the off-screen kill of Tony. Uh, that's, the, j- that's the guy who just fell when the door opened. Uh, my rating, I gave it a six and a quarter. Uh, it's an enjoyable film. It's a quick watch with a pretty decent atmosphere. I like the premise, and I like the on-campus setting. I like Lori and the cast of teens in this movie, and now this is where I'm going to you know, get, my, my, uh, get, get the weight off my shoulders about this franchise. However, this is the epitome of what I don't like about the Halloween franchise. This is one of my least favorite portrayals of Michael Myers. He looks small and weak and portrayed weak. The masks are all terrible. I wrote when capital letters, respect the OG slasher. Laurie basically bullies him at the end. Him driving all the way from Illinois to California is ridiculous. He get gas along the way over the 2,000 mile trip. I don't blame the directors or writers for the ending, only a cod. If you wanted more sequels, I understand, but please do the ending better. There's too many cheap jump scares as well. Still enjoyable, but I feel like there were too many Friday the 13th, Scream, and Psycho nods when it should have been more focused on being a great Halloween film. That's basically what I said about it. <laughs> but I do like this Nick. movie. I ranked it, what, oh, yeah, 12 or whatever in 31? Yeah. I'll go ahead and get mine out of the way. Uh, my favorite kill was... Uh, Jimmy, I know it was off screen, but having a skate to your face was cool. Now, on the other hand, my least favorite kill is Tony as well, just the off screen aspect of it as well, because the unbelievability of that body just stood there for however long. Why was the body on the outside anyway? And then door opens and he just falls down. Uh, Tired of that. Get rid of that in horror films. Don't ever bring it back. Uh, For a rating, I went with a five. Uh, Like I said, this is... Not one of my favorite Halloween movies. I had it 20th out of the 31 films we ranked last night. Uh, it's just they left too much potential out there 
for my taste. They this could have been, and I, I get it. Like Mustafa Akkad, and like there was a lot of cooks in the kitchen, like I said, but they still could have put a better product out there. Shelf it until you can get your shit together. If you have to, don't you ever put a CGI mask on my screen ever again. So it's just I went with a five. Could have been better, but still not as bad as some other movies we've watched. Yeah, so, uh, okay, I mean, you're not in Haddonfield, but, you know, you know what? You get the atmosphere. Um, we've talked about that. That's right. Um, you get the same, you know, basic Halloween plot. And, and you, you, you even get, you know, the somewhat claustrophobic setting of, like, being inside those four walls of the school the entire mm-hmm. time, kind of like, you know, we do in four. Um, I like the soundtrack. Um, I'm... <laughs> I mean, they actually, tidbit, they actually used some of the Scream soundtrack because the producers meddled in that too. But I like Scream, so that meddling's okay. Um, my favorite kill is, uh, is was Will, actually. And, uh, you know, I'm in agreement with you guys for the least favorite kill. But I picked Charlie, but shit, it's, it was a been a toss-up, honestly. Um, the Mask brings my rating down a full point yeah. um, to me. It's... Uh, you know, we, there's a whole there's a whole big long explanation about Mustafa Akkad and screwing up the masks and how he told them not to ever use a William Shatner mask again. Which I mean, after four, and it's just you saw what you got. So he he not only screwed up you know a, a, a lot in this franchise. I mean, he not only brought a lot, but he screwed up a lot too. So you know, um, my rating actually is an eight. Um, you know, I, I like I said, I would have rated it a nine just for for all the reasons that I kind of talked forever about in my opening. Um, you know, it, it's it's got a lot of nostalgia for me and a, a lot of good. Um, but you know, hey, I nitpicked this thing just like you know we did twenty eighteen. You know, I, I nitpicked a lot, uh, even if you like it. So um, it, it would have been a nine, but it the mask is what brings it down a whole point for me. All right, Freddie, go ahead, brother. Right, my favorite kill of the movie is Will, and I'm going to kind of take a di- different approach on this one. My least favorite was the kill- the Killing the Johnny, even though the skate through the face was that. I loved it. I would love to see how that transpired. That's the only reason it's my least favorite kill. I would love to see that actually in the movie. That's the only reason it's my least favorite kill. Um, Rating-wise, I'll give this movie a 6.7. Just because the mask deal, and I think this time they kind of I didn't like how they portrayed Michael, they made him look kind of softer than what we were used to seeing Mike look like. Um, I didn't really like the way they ha- had him playing this role, so that's the, it was a cool movie, and there's some things I felt like they left out, and kind of like you said early in the mo- um, pod, they left a lot of meat on the bone, and we could have got a lot, a lot better movie than what we did. But still, still a pretty decent movie. But it left a lot, a lot out there for the fans. Oh yeah, and I just, I just want everyone to, that's listening, you know, I hope I didn't come across too bad in my rating. Honestly, I enjoy this movie. I've watched this movie several times. Uh, it's a fast, easy watch. It's, a, it's very enjoyable. But uh, you know, I like to see progression with my slashers. Honestly. Like, you watch, I mean, Steve Miner directed Friday 13th Part 2. Jason wasn't the badass in Jason, in Friday 13th Part 2. But as the franchise went on, you know, he got stronger, stronger. And, you know, he got he got bigger and better as it went on. I wish I wish the Halloween would have kind of did that, honestly, in this movie. I mean, it's been 20, it's been 20 years. Let him, let him be more of a menace, you know. Why is Lori the only one who's the badass at the end? I don't, I just... I just wish they would show Michael because that's why season of the witch got hated on so much because it didn't have Myers in it. People love the Michael Myers character and I'm sure all of us love the Michael Myers character. We want to see him be, you know, if Lori wins at the end, okay, but let him put up a better fight than what, what he did. Cause he just got bullied to me at the end of it. He felt, I, I felt like Michael Myers felt like me every time I mentioned a movie I've never seen with the rest of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I do like this movie, so I hope I didn't come across too harsh. Uh, does anybody I mean, have any final thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say our composite score for this one was a 6.59. So uh, you, I was the only one that rated it under what the average rating on IMDb is. Uh, average rating on there is a 5.8. So I, I don't think anyone was overly critical of it. 
as far as rating goes, except for me. And I feel like we all had justifications. We had reasons for our nitpicks, so no need to apologize in my, in, in my eyes. Absolutely not. Nope. Yeah, I d- that's why I love 18 so much. There's been – we see the progress of Lori and we see the progress of Myers, you know, after 40 years. They're both badasses now. And it was a pretty epic battle between them two at the end. Of it. That's why it's such a good ending because it's such a – it took all three Strode ladies to, you know, the def- – defeat michael because i mean we know there's two more so they didn't kill right. him off yet but I, I love the michael myers character contrary to whatever i put on twitter i love michael myers i just wish they would uh, portray him a little better in some movies but hopefully the next two do that oh uh, do y'all got any final thoughts we get out of here it's been a two-hour episode uh, <laughs> i feel like that spongebob uh gif where he's like whoo, whoo, you know <laughs> <laughs> no i'm good i've said all i got man nope Hey, Freddie, uh, just want to thank you for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, You were a great guest tonight, and a big shout-out. Hey, honestly, man, thank you for what you did for our favorite football team. We really appreciate it, man. Uh, We're all Florida State football fans, and we enjoy the content you put out on social media. You know know what you're talking about. So uh, if if you're a Florida State football fan, go follow him on Twitter. uh, Or do you have Instagram? If you have Instagram, follow him on there, too. We'll tag you in both of our uh, Facebook and Instagram posts if you have an Instagram. Yeah, they're both. My Instagram and Twitter are both the same. Okay. Yeah, so show love to uh, Freddie. He's a he's an awesome guy. He's real down to earth. Uh, he's a fun follow on Twitter. He clowns a lot, but he also brings a lot of uh, education on a lot of different topics, not just football. So uh, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, everyone. For, thank you, everyone who listened. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. I think we have another theme month coming, so stay tuned on social media for what our next theme is. Appreciate it, guys. Y'all have a good one.